Good morning and welcome to this morning's meeting of the Police and Crime Committee on June the 9th, 2021. My name is Sean Bailey and I'm your chair. Can I start by recognising Assemblymember Garrett, who is an addition, uh, a temporary addition to the committee today, to speak particularly on item six as it um, pertains to his local area where he's a representative. Our main business this morning will be to discuss with our invited guests, violent crime in London. Please can you make sure your electronic devices are switched off, at least to silent, no vibrating please, particularly if you have a microphone on your desk. Silent is the word for the day when it pertains to electronic devices. Can I call um, uh, Lauren Harvey, our clerk, to tell us if you had any apologies? Thank you, Chair, no apologies have been received this morning. Thank you. Um, I move on to declaration of interest. Can I ask the committee to note the recommendations set out in item two and ask members if they have any other interests to declare? I take silence as no, nothing to declare. Can we confirm the minutes of the Police and Crime Committee held on the 17th of March 2021 to be signed by me in a, as a correct record? Thank you very much. Can we note the completed, ongoing and closed actions arising from previous meetings of the committee and additional correspondence received? Thank you. Can we note the actions taken by the former chair of the committee under delegated authority following consultation with party group leads to agree the output set out in the agenda? We now move on to our main item of business, which is the question and answer session with invited guests on violent crime in London. I'd like to welcome our invited guests, um, Commander Alex Murray, OBE, from the violent, the, sorry, the violent Crime Lead and Metropolitan Police Service. Good to see you, Alex. Anne-Marie Wilson, Deputy Head of Operation Divert. Rosaline Holsborough, Custody Invitation, inv invent, Excuse me, my AP was making speaking difficult. Intervention coach, divert. Steve. Like the number. Okay, thank you. Steve Four. Steve Four. Thank you, Steve. Helping that pronunciation is an extraordinary spelling here. Chief Executive Croydon Voluntary Action, Mayans Programme, and, and Anthony King, who will be joining us later. Um, as Chairman, I'd like to thank our guests for attending this morning and for their answers to our questions. I can I ask the committee to note the report and discussion. Can we also delegate authority to me as chair in consultation? Oh, sorry, I've skipped ahead. Excuse me. Excuse me. Let me just ask the first question to get us off rolling. Good morning once again to all of our guests. As we all know, crime is for many Londoners, the single most pressing issue going on. I, I personally have been in youth work for 20 years and crime is the issue that, that dominates everything. So I want to start out um, the question by talking about as London emerges from lockdown. Um, this is to all of you and I'll, I'll bring you in to, to, to have your say on this. Um, what is your current assessment of violent crime in London? Maybe if I start with Alex Murray. Thank you very much. Uh, it's good to be here and thanks for the, for the question. Um, it goes without saying that COVID presented lots of opportunities and disadvantages for Londoners, but the one thing we did see was a significant reduction in all crime, uh, especially violent crime throughout COVID at different rates. Um, so the first lockdown, significant reductions in our m biggest violent crime types, largely robbery up to 60, 70% even in the March first lockdown. Uh, and overall, over the period, we've seen a significant reduction of, you know, circa 25-26%. Um, it's always worrying talking about statistics because ev behind every statistics is a family and a friend. The, the level of violence in London is still, though, too, too high. Uh, as you know, it is a number one priority for you and for me and for the Met Commissioner. And as a result of that, we've got an unparalleled amount of activity to tackle violence um, across every team in London, the reactive teams, the proactive teams, the teams that specialise in violence. Uh, and over this summer period, especially as we come out of lockdown, uh, we've got a huge focus in different aspects from enforcement, suppression, prevention, partnership, and working with communities to get on top of violence because we recognise it's not something that the police can do on their own. Thank you. Let me just add an additional question for you. Are you 
actively tracking the difference between the violent the trends in violent crime for people below 25 and above 25 because there's often a focus on young people but we're beginning to pick up a trend that older people are also getting very involved in this and there's a, a trend of older people attacking other older people yeah absolutely so you're right we we focus a lot on youth violence youth homicide uh, and we have a significant amount of interventions whether that's in schools or locally and engagement but you're also right to say that the majority of homicides are not under 25s. They are over 25s. Um, domestic homicides uh, is significant. Um, and older people and people who are not necessarily involved in gangs either are being subject to, uh, to murder and serious violence. Uh, and uh, knife injury, um, again, though, across all the data sets and all the age ranges has gone down. But uh, again, it's still, it's still too high to the point where none of us are satisfied and we're certainly not satisfied, but we are, we do track all that data. Okay, thank you. Emery, if I could ask you, what, what's your assessment of, of current violent crime in London? How, in the work you do, what, what, what is it, what are the big trends that you're seeing emerging? Um, well, as Alex said, it is still very, it's very much um, too high and it is the focus point of the Divert programme. Uh, what we found is that the majority of individuals that benefit from the program are 18 to 25 year olds the crimes that they're being arrested for are robberies burglaries thefts that sort of thing okay S steve can i can i put the same question to you what is your current assessment of violent crime in london and and the impact of of, of easing lockdown it's we know that it's the pressure cooker effect, isn't it? We're all expecting things to, to kick off in the summer. We're looking to put on as many events in Croydon as we can. So on London Road, we're going to have a carnival in the first week of August, which will have the organisations, young people organisations like Finesse Forever uh, that we've been working with over the last year, who will be leading that, who will be getting young people engaged with uh, control of the stage management, um, targeting hundreds of, of, of the people that we've been in contact with, as I say, over, over the last year, to try to get them to see positive activities as, you know, their, their, their way forward. Um, sounds a bit cliché, doesn't it? But I think that's what we're hoping that we can do to prevent any further escalation throughout the year. Um, make sure that we're giving young people those options, those alternatives. Rosalind? Is, is there, what, what, what trends are you picking up from the work you're doing? I mean, I'm, I'm a custody intervention coach based yeah. at Wood Green, so my perspective is only from a local borough of Haringey. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly we are seeing, you know, every week I see at least two clients that come in for violent offences involving dangerous weapons. Um, there is an emphasis as well on drug supply and I think that's from an economical point of view because clearly the, the, the 18 to 25 year olds that I'm holding consultations with in the custody suite um, ultimately that's what I'm there for to, to offer them you know uh, opportunities into work so a lot of them are unemployed um, a lot of them are not actually claiming benefits so they're not actually even in the system at any okay. point so they must be vulnerable to economic reasons and, and trying to earn money and I think that's where the the, the drug offences are coming in, but certainly it's mainly drug offences and violent crime. I would say that on my return to the custody suite from the lockdowns, there was definitely an increase in domestic abuse as well. Um, and I think that was just from a, a perspective of not managing emotions and, you know, tensions were, were building. So they weren't so much in, in relation to do with violence, but yeah, certainly there is the, the same kind of trends that everyone's talked about in Haringey. Okay, thank you. Let me just quickly um, move on. I, I direct this again at Commander Murray to start with. As restrict... Just before you move on, just very quickly. Um, question to the Commander. So in the, um, in the current assessment, and congratulations on the work of the Met in terms of the contribution of tackling county lines and some of the issues, I think it was really um, impressive uh, of our contribution towards that. In terms of the trends and assessments of gang-related violence, which, you know, again, if we listen to the media, most of the deaths are gang-related, what is the assessment where you have 
where homicides or violent crime connected to gang-related activity is there is there a percentage that you can give us in terms of, uh, let's say, deaths in London related to gangs, county lines, activity? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question, and we, we struggle with definitions all the time. So we, we do have a definition of gang-related homicides, but it's when we understand that the motivation is gang retaliation, oh. and it's actually quite low. Having said that, a significant amount of people who have been murdered are connected either on the periphery or right in the centre of gangs. Um, so it, it's hard to say um, uh, and to be binary about it. So we're, we're talking si single-digit gang-related homicides if you follow a very specific definition, but a significant proportion of people are known to be associating with gangs, but we can't say it's gang-motivated, the actual homicide. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I suppose it could be hard to differentiate the lifestyle. And, uh, uh, let me ask you, when you're speaking to young people, how many of them identify themselves, you know, in, in every 10 of your young people you deal with, how, how many of them would identify themselves as a gang member? Not many at all. Yeah. You know, you're, you're reading between the lines, you yeah. know, we're, we're in the custody suite, we have access to particular information that, that the Met share with us in order for us to make that assessment based on maybe previous or warning signals, what they're known for. So ultimately, you're building a your own picture using the information from the Met. That is not something that I'm disclosing to, to the young person when I'm speaking to them. So I'm trying to get them to a point where there is enough rapport with me where they'll start disclosing certain things. Um, so yeah, not, not many at all. It is, it is about reading in between the lines and looking at the activity and the previous activity of that person to work out you know, they, 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 if, whether they're active or not in gangs. Thank you. Can I, sorry, can I just uh, on that point as well? One of the things that I found when I was um, a practitioner is that lots of these individuals don't actually identify themselves to being in a gang. Uh, to them, their friends are their own little community. Um, so when you label them with the term gang, some of them are actually quite offended by it because they feel that we're not a gang. We're just a small group of friends who like to, to walk about together. Yeah. I, I recognise that assessment from my own youth. Well, that's, that's, that's very important because it, it, I think sometimes we ask for stats and we expect to be told in or out and that isn't how a person views themselves. Um, Commander Murray, as, we, as restrictions from lockdown are lifted, how do you anticipate violence levels in London changing up or down? We all we all think they're going to go up, but you know by what level? Are you prepared for them? Had things happened across lockdown that you you'll be able to use positively to keep these numbers down? Uh, thanks for the question. Yes, yeah, so um, there is. I, I can tell you now the violence is rising compared to lockdown. Um, so what we do in the Met is we compare our data to 2019 when there wasn't a lockdown and we see how we're doing there. So we, as you mentioned, we fully expect to bounce back and we are seeing that bounce back, but it is being suppressed below the 2019 levels. So it's coming up again from a very low sort of COVID restriction lockdown. Uh, so robbery is going up, knife injury violence for under 25 year olds is going up, um, knife crime is going up as we come out of lockdown. But compared to 2019, we're not seeing the return to the levels of pre-COVID. And I think it's our job and, and everyone's job to try and minimise that increase. But we, we are seeing it. Uh, we, we've got the weather. Some people um, uh, are coming out, drinking more. There's knife carrying uh, and more people about, more opportunity, more robbery. Uh, and, and as we all expected, that increase is happening. OK. Are you having looks at particular flashpoints? Like I made the point to the mayor that High Park has traditionally been a flashpoint, and we saw what happened a couple of weekends ago. But are, are you mapping these points across London? Is work being done to hold the violence down? Uh, absolutely. We, you know, we've got a week plan, a month plan, a summer plan, and we know that one of the most effective sort of evidence-based police interventions to prevent violence is getting our officers in the places in a sort of surgical way where violence is the highest, providing that visible deterrence or having someone close by who can catch someone who's involved in it. So part, part of my job is making sure we have those areas mapped and we have officers in those areas. How are you mapping the impact of easing of restrictions? 
across, particularly across not just violence that's visible to us, but also domestic violence as well? Yeah, it, so we're a data-driven organisation and, and we are responsive day on day on day to changes in trends. So um, every, every day we, I have a 10, 15 meeting where we look at everything that's happened over the last 24 hours and we say, do we need to respond to an uptick in violence here or here? Plus, our intel department are working on uh, identifying those hotspots so we get the officers in the places at the right time. Um, domestic abuse, uh, you know, it's part of an ongoing debate looking at the data around whether there was an increase during lockdown or not. And there's two sides of the argument here. Quite a lot of NGOs are saying they saw an increase in traffic uh, on their phone lines. We didn't see a necessary increase in reported domestic abuse. So a lot of people are trying to un unpick that uh, as um, Rosalind mentioned, we do expect now the pubs are open, now the football's on, that there will be an uptick in domestic violence. And, uh, you know, 15% of our calls into our call centre are on domestic violence. Um, and it is a significant priority for us. Sorry, Chair. Can I just ask a quick question? You've mentioned hotspots. Um, and I see that um, in our reporting here, in our notes, you've got various places in London that you know are hot spots. Is there anything that they've all got in common? Is it where rival gangs go or is it an open space? What, what do you think is at the base of these hot spots that make them a hot spots? Yeah, it's so interesting question. And, um, you know, some. I was tackled on my use of the word hotspots uh, only this week where someone said it's not a hotspot, it's a community, but, uh, the, um, but we do call them hotspots. Uh, and London is incredibly diverse and variable, so it does vary. But traditionally, they are areas of high footfall, like transport hubs. As you're coming out of a station where a lot of people are congregating and there's a lot of opportunities, that's a hotspot. Um, temporarily, it varies. So you're right, the parks uh, in summertime are going to be a hotspot where a lot of people meet. Um, it is worth saying, though, that quite a lot of the violence, non-sort of city centre or non-nighttime economy violence, is concentrated in areas of deprivation. Um, and we have seen those hotspots probably unchanging, you know, over... LSE have done quite a lot of work on this over the last 100 years or so. Um, and they are ingrained, um, often poverty-driven hotspots where... This, this is where the police can only go so far to take knives off the street, but where we work with communities to tackle some of the underlying issues there. Okay, thank you. That's interesting. Thank you. Thanks. Good go. Commander, I wanted to ask about the, the general perception I keep on hearing that crime went down during lockdown. Do you think it really did go down, or is it a question of a lot of it was just underreported? You mentioned the domestic angle, particularly domestic abuse, but do you really believe gangs just sort of gave up and watched television during much of lockdown, or do you think a lot of crimes haven't been reported, people didn't go to the NHS, obviously, because they were scared of COVID as well, and therefore actually crime was higher during lockdown than we fear? No, I, I genuinely believe that crime did go down. I think there are some crime types that may, may have gone up, but large majority, I think... Uh, has gone down. You know, we share data with A&E departments, so I'm satisfied that they also saw a reduction in people being stabbed or people being shot. A lot of crime is driven by opportunity. Uh, and so, albeit, you know, someone who's engaged in robbery isn't going to obey COVID restrictions, there's no one out there for them to rob. The opportunity, no one's walking around with their phones out. Uh, and uh, a 70% reduction, 65% reduction in reported robbery during the first lockdown I think is unequivocal really and that's our biggest violent uh, crime driver so uh, so yes I do for domestic abuse you're right there you know people who are subject to coercive control may not feel safe phoning the police because their partner's not leaving the house perhaps but we're also hearing again anecdotally that that partner was also not in the pub because they were shut and was also not going to the football because it was shut. And in actual fact, so, so it's quite difficult to unpick the domestic violence picture, I think, around what the drivers were there. And the question was about change. Do you think that we're going to see a lot of change specifically now? Or is it back to the conventional, almost, dare I say, without wanting to actually uh, foresee the future in terms of we often have issues in the summer? Do you think those issues, when now it's getting hot, are just going to be like they have been in, in previous years? 
Yeah, I, I think we'll certainly see an uptick in violence. I, I'm really hoping that there, there is something around COVID and the reduction in crime that will have a legacy effect in the summer and suppress, you know, returning to the 2019 levels. One, one thing we've done, we're doing now and we did in the March lockdown was visit a number of people who have violent crime records to say, look, you haven't engaged in, and I did some of these visits myself to, to young people on the edges or in gangs. You, you haven't been in trouble now for a whole series of weeks. You felt safer. What is it that we can do to make sure that this continues now the lockdown is lifting? And we've just visited 800 people uh, in partnership with probation to give that exact message to say, look, how did it feel? And look, you can maintain this through the lifting of lockdown. So I'm, I'm hoping there will be a positive legacy in relation to violence. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping, but we won't take that for granted. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I just want to quickly talk about there's an anticipated rise in crime coming around the Euro um, 2012, 2021 now, really, um, situation. How are you planning for that? So, uh, as, as you can imagine, we've got uh, significant plans to police the public order associated with uh, the Euros. That is one of the biggest drivers of crime. Um, Jane Connors, who you know, is leading for that as gold. Um, but we work very closely together. And in actual fact, we, so we have our, our PSUs, you know, an inspector and 21 officers who are ready for public order. But when they are not deployed on the Euros, if there is no trouble, in fact, they're being diverted to support the violence suppression work in some of those hotspots that we spoke about so that we can use the effort uh, for policing the Euros to tackle violence as well. Rosalind, a quick question. Have any of your young people received one of these visits from the police? Then would you work to have said that over lockdown they'd be visited by the police? I... I'm not aware of that. I mean, you know, one of the emphasis of, of divert is that we're independent from the Met yeah. Police. As much as we're based in the custody suite, there is that trust factor that I need to build with clients um, in terms of, you know, my work with them is going to be independent from, from whatever the charges are, whatever their previous uh, things are. I think what I will say is, I mean, I'm not sure if any of my clients had that visit, but I know that certainly working in the custody suites now, we're starting to liaise a lot more with the internal kind of MET teams. So I have been told by one of the inspectors that, you know, about these home visits and about mm -hmm. trying to um, work in a sort of a multi-agency type way. But obviously there are issues with how the police are received at homes. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's something that we're hoping to try and liaise with the Met a bit more in terms of doing those home visits. I mean, naturally, our work, if people are engaging, we're going to naturally work with them in the community anyway. Um, but no, specifically to that, that question, I don't know if any of my, I don't think any of my clients had a particular visit from the police during that time, but, but that's something that, that could happen in the future. Thank you. Just a quick supplementary almost. Commander, lockdown has prevented has prevented lots of crimes happening. The inquisitive nature of crime has changed, but it's also given us new types of crime. So I was in Camden and had lots of illegal parties in the Primrose Hill area. Local shop owners had their property damaged, etc. Are we worried that lockdown will give us some new types of crime? Like I spoke to a young person who said now they organise parties much more regularly to sell drugs than they would have done before lockdown. Lockdown. Are we, are we seeing new crimes arising specifically because of lockdown restrictions? Yeah, so we were really worried about fraud um, when, uh, the first, with the first lockdown because no one's about and everyone's online. We didn't see, you know, there were some sort of signal crimes where uh, really horrible crimes that took place, but we, we didn't see the increase in fraud. Cyber crime is a big issue and is, in, is increasing. That was, a, that was COVID created. To your point around the parties and the unlicensed music events, they have, they pose some significant issues for us from a violent point of view as well, because often that's where we see some firearms offences um, and they give us concern. And whenever we have intelligence that one is taking place, um, we have specific patrols that are aimed at tackling those big parties, those unlicensed music events. Uh, and during COVID, obviously, uh, any gathering was illegal and, and we took a, a very strong line on that because we, our, our job as a membership of the public health sort of team was to make sure that we didn't have that spread. So we were regularly going to parties um, to disrupt those and, where necessary, give fixed penalty tickets. Thank you. We're going to move on to our second section now about reducing violence.
Uh, Marita? Thank you. Oh, sorry. Have I not, have I not called you in, Caroline? Um, I think, um, didn't Nick have a question I was coming in off the back of it? I think, Chair, you asked, you asked a question about, um, about monitoring the impact of, uh, of the restriction. Of You're the completely right. Excuse me for that, Nick. Is there what? anything you'd like to add to that? Well, I suppose the only other question I would add um, or I'd put on that um, is what, what lessons were learned from last year? Um, because it certainly seemed in certain parts of London that um, the, the sort of increase in violent crime and social behaviour did seem to take people by surprise. I know there are areas of my constituency, Richmond Green, Twickenham Green and the Riversides, where there was an enormous increase in um, and social behaviour and, uh, and violent crime that really genuinely seemed to take the yourselves, the Met, councils and residents by surprise. So, so what lessons have you learned from that experience? Uh, I think we're increasingly responsive, so the, the, the daily battle with them of understanding the trends and responding to them takes place on a BCU, like the one you're talking about, and on a PAN-MET level. Um, and the other, the other real opportunity here is the Police Uplift Programme has given us an opportunity to recruit more officers, and one of the things we're doing, and it, it placed, placed your point, I think, is for the first time in a while recruiting town centre teams across the whole of London. So. Um, Previously, because we've been lim had limited resources, our officers have had to respond across a whole borough or a whole area. This time, we're in the process of recruiting dedicated town centre teams in those areas, for example, it, whether it's Richmond or any town centre, who will know the people, know the places, and respond to everything from ASB violence, shoplifting, knowing the businesses. And I, and I think that's an incredible opportunity and really welcome. So based, essentially you're saying that the, the police uplift programme is sort of changing the landscape of local policing. Then. Yeah, we, we, what we're not doing is uniformly building every team up pro rata. Yeah. We, one of the things we're doing with the uplift programme, and we're building across certain specialities, is, is local town centre teams, which are you know, across every constituency in London. And I, I think that will be an incredibly beneficial impact of the uplift programme. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. But before we continue, can I just quickly bring in Caroline? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we're talking about um, easing of COVID restrictions, Commander. Can you update us on the work the Met are undertaking with boroughs and with schools to proactively support and identify children who may have been victims of domestic violence and abuse over the last year in lockdown? Uh, I can answer half the question and Caroline will perhaps get back to you later on the, the latter half. Um, so youth violence we're really concerned about. We have 426 permanent safer school officers um, whose job it is to be in the priority schools, building relationships, making sure we're safeguarding, receiving referrals, uh, talking through drugs, talking through violence, um, and I think they have an incredible impact. We also then have our youth problem solvers, five each side of the river, north and south, uh, who act as sort of problem solvers and coordinators. We have youth engagement officers, uh, you know, many per BCU who are building relationships. Our designing out crime officers are working in key youth clubs to uh, maximise um, the prevention of violence in those youth clubs. Um, and we have uh, yacht officers e everywhere in every BCU who's working around youth crime. So uh, I think there's a significant investment and focus on youth engagement and safeguarding. In relation to how we understand whether a child has witnessed the corrosive effects of domestic abuse and what we're doing and how we refer those into multi-agency safeguarding hubs. That's something that isn't my area of speciality, but I can get back to you. I, I am pretty sure we will have data sharing initiatives in a multi-agency safeguarding hub with local children's services where if a child has been subject to domestic abuse, the referral will come uh, into the safeguarding hub and hopefully shared with the school so that the wraparound care can be given but I can get back to you on that. Yeah, I think as it's one of the issues coming out of lockdown, we expect to see an increase. It would be useful to have an update on that. Thank you. And, and we know that being a child in, uh, and witnessing domestic abuse is a, one of the key drivers for all sorts of outcomes in later life. So. Yeah, thank you. If you could give us the contact details of who we should be addressing about that, we, we, will, we will write to them. And I think later on in our work programme, we'll pick up domestic violence. Um, um, Assembly Member Ahmed. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my first question is for Commander Murray. Uh, what is working well across the Violent Crime, Crime Task Force and Violent Suppression Units, and what's proving more challenging, in your opinion? So I, I think the, 
I, I like to reflect on how we approach COVID in London and, and, the, and the public health approach we took, um, where we were data driven. Uh, every day so I was involved with COVID, I met with the NHS, with the local authorities, with public health. The data was there. We all then knew our specific role. And I think for violence reduction, the role of the police is quite clear. Um, and that is around detecting crime, getting justice for victims, being proactive, seizing drugs, knives, guns, suppressing, so being on the street, ne if necessary, taking knives off people. Um, and then being in the hotspots and then problem solving. And problem solving is understanding some of the core drivers of violence in an area and working in partnership with local authorities, with partners, but also the community. Uh, now, this is something that the Violence Reduction Unit uh, is also supporting with the MyENS programme. I think one of the things we really need to do, reflecting on the public health approach, um, is be community-led on our violence interventions to get underneath some of the big problems. The, you know, there's no point local authority, us, the Assembly, or, uh, or the police coming and say, here's, here's the way we're going to solve your violent crime problems. Um, the community uh, knows best around what what can work and I think there's something around how do the police not lead but work with and support community influencers who can unpick some of the longer term problems I think that's the answer to dealing with uh, you know <clears throat> a year two years three years some of those uh, violent crime problems and that that is a challenge you know we're in addition to tackling violence our, our equal priority is building trust with communities and we recognize that some communities don't trust us as much as we want them to and so if we're looking at community interventions that can tackle violence with the police, uh, building trust is essential. Okay. Thank you, Commander. Um, just, just on the back of that and from what you've just said about the relationships you're trying to build with local communities, um, as, as you're aware, last week that we had an appalling um, situation in Brixton, my own constituency in Brixton, where a young man was shot and stabbed and then the police officers who were attending were also attacked. Um, I, just, I wondered what, how you're working across London with that kind of situation where the community is being reassured and you've talked about the various bodies that you're working through but I wondered also are you using the neighbourhood panels, the various, um, sorry, the neighbourhood boards, the ward panels in terms of reassuring and listening to local communities? How is that affecting the work that you're doing? Yes, it's uh, it in a big way, uh, key priority for us, um, building those relationships with communities. And as I mentioned, in some areas, it's not as effective as, as, as it should be. But it's really interesting to see some of the work going on in Croydon uh, on the back of some of the Black Lives Matter protests where bridges are increasingly being built. Um, and it is, there is community-led interventions. There are weekly meetings with many young people saying, what are we gonna do around violence? Uh, and and I was really encouraged to see that in an area where historically, you know, there has been an absence of, of trust. And it is a real challenge. You know, we and you are committed to tackling violence, but the, the absence of trust in some areas means that that motivation is sometimes questioned. Uh, and uh, we need to prove to communities, A, that we can be fair, but B, that that's our motivation is to get violence down. Thank you very much. And the well, final question is for all of the panel. Um, in your opinion, how effective is the current balance between prevention and enforcement? And rather than starting with you, uh, Commander Murray, perhaps we'll start with you. Sorry, I'm pausing because actually I was going to pick up a point um, that, that Alex said. Part of my role working in custody is to almost discuss a different side of the police. So, you know, ultimately I'm working with 18 to 25 year olds coming in they have an attitude towards the police and what I'm trying to say to them as, as, as evidence is if this wasn't about safeguarding and looking at how we can help them I wouldn't even be sitting in the custody suite so you know it's about getting them to understand that the police have actually been kind enough to let us in um, the culture of custody is, is changing you know often an arresting officer might actually refer a young person, a young adult to me. And that's something that I can actually explain to the client that I'm working with. You know, it's not about enforcement, this, just enforcement. This is about looking at an opportunity as to whether we can put some support in to actually 
you know, divert you away from being in the criminal justice system. And that's huge. And I do emphasise that quite, quite a bit with the clients. So I think that that is also helping, you know, I don't know, public relations. It's helping uh, to change mindsets around what coming into custody is all about. You know, there is an opportunity. You will be offered some intervention of some kind whilst you're in custody. So it's a kind of a twofold uh, thing. I don't know if that answers answers the question. Interesting. Thank you. I wonder, Rosalie, if you could. Yes, I definitely have a, a very positive relationship um, with the police, and we have been embedded within uh, Brixton Custody's uh, state. Brixton Police Station since 2015, so there is definitely a, a massive culture shift. The officers are um, happy to talk about the programme to the young people that are coming in and to accept referrals, which they then pass on to the CICs. Um, so that's been a very positive relationship, and I feel that that's helped to build a relationship with the community and the police because what the, the wider community is seeing is actually my son was arrested or my daughter was arrested and they actually received a very positive service whilst they was in custody, which is, I think, fantastic. And also, um, just to go back on a point where you spoke about the VCTF and the other violent suppression units, one of the things that we did was we collaborated with some of those police operations and the CICs received quite a few referrals as well and were able to help those individuals who had been arrested for violent crime and get them into training and education. Thank you. Uh, I think you're, you're seeing um, the merging of prevention and in enforcement, and, and they're not actually distinct things. You know, if we're going to prevent crime, firstly, we need to understand who are the people we need to work with to prevent crime. So we need to uh, catch them. You know, so we need to catch a robber to understand how we can involve uh, people like Divert and get them uh, and prevent them committing further crime. I think there's some societal things around general prevention like poverty alleviation that you know the police don't I excel at but prevention and enforcement I think go hand in hand and, and become one and, this, one and the same thing. This is all about looking for long term solutions isn't it? You know in, in Croydon as you say weekly meetings so, Inspector James Weston, head of the VSU, he's been part of that since mm -hmm. the, the very start. He started referring to his engagement and enforcement strategy rather than the other way round. And, you know, when we were talking about hotspots earlier on, again, it's, it's the legacy that we're looking for. We had Operation Cleveland on a, a hotspot, the one we're in, London Road. It was fantastic while it lasted for four weeks. We had the police, the VSU, based in our community hub. Um, you won't be surprised to hear that some of the issues have come right back. And, and I appreciate, obviously, resources is such an issue, but you know, in the same way with COVID, we're looking for a legacy. We, we need to build on all of the work that we're doing in Croydon. Anthony and I, we're, we're looking you know, five, 10 years, not the two years of my ends. And I think you know, what we've got to do, I, again, data-driven, understand. We're people-driven. You know, you're not gonna get from the data the kind of stories we're hearing from young people the kind of life stories the police are hearing, because Anthony brought the young people into training for the new recruits at the Warren in, you know, South London. And, and it's that kind of relationship building which has been at the heart of our approach. And again, another cliche, but prevention is all about the building of relationships. And uh, that's, I think, where we've put most of our energy, isn't it? Absolutely. I, I think um, we need to really scale back to having uh, 21 young BME males um, in a park in Croydon who uh, didn't have any good experience or good narrative regarding the Met Police and their interactions. Some of them have seen siblings arrested, um, loved ones pass away due to knife crime, and the very thought of getting uh, partnership working between the Met and young black males was a major challenge. Um, it's been highlighted many times here in meetings here at City Hall regarding challenges around the young black males in London and the Met Police. We decided to look at a new approach, which is conversation and engagement versus enforcement. So we do understand that the Met have a job to enforce, but we're just looking at the power of the conversation first. Bringing the Met senior officers to the park where the young people engage and start to build up interaction, to have the young people speak their truths, their narratives about some of the challenges they've had. The success of it is now you've had 15 young black males 
go to the Warren um, uh, and train your officers, your new recruits, 21-year-old, 19-year-olds that uh, have been from Sussex, Kent, surrounding areas who are now policing in the challenging part of Croydon. Uh, it's the young black males that have been privileged enough to speak their truths, their narratives, speak to the officers about styles of engagement, and the positive relationships are now very evident to see. Um, that would that uh, historically that wouldn't have happened, but the BCU in the south have shown their commitment to seeing change in Croydon. I think that for me speaks volumes. The fact that you now have young people who would never have engaged with the Met having tremendous interaction with the Met. Any issue that now goes on in Croydon, you find that the young people via WhatsApp are having communication with senior uh, leaders in, in the Met Police. Um, drill artists are now in great conversations with your with your leadership team in, in the south of the borough. So we're really grateful for that and the fact that the Met are demonstrating a commitment to seeing change through conversation and engagement. Thank you, Jim. Uh, uh, do you want to quickly cover you? Yeah, um, I want to come back to the engagement piece, but before we do that, could you just describe the and paint some pictures about the work of the Violent Task Force Group, which receives money from both the Mayor and central government and well as the violent suppression units I, I get the picture of a london-wide tasking group or deployment of resources but what um where does the local bcu violent suppression unit comes if the if the uh, bcu commander has that resource and flex to deploy those resources can you just paint us a, a picture of where all that comes together i, I get your role you mentioned that yep. earlier on on a day-to-day -day basis of seeing the wider picture? So it's a good question and it plays your point on Croydon, Croydon. So violent suppression units are brigaded in BCUs. They belong to the BCUs. They deal with the issues and they're not going anywhere. They're not going to be deployed away. They know the streets, they know the people, they know the characters. Um, yes, they'll be doing some suppression work, i.e. being in the areas where they're most needed, but they're also building the relationships and engaging. So what you've seen here with people going in and coming out um, shouldn't happen as much. Uh, they're limited in their size and clearly violence trends move around London all the time and that's where the VCTF come in. So they are centrally brigaded and they can surge into areas where there are upticks in violence that the local BCU won't have the capacity to deal with that needs some people and some presence immediately. They don't move on a day-to-day -day basis, so we call it Operation Hercules. They'll go in for three months. They have two types of deployment, three months and one month. Three months to, again, get a better understanding, to do some work around um, taking out uh, some uh, big drug dealers or some violent crime issues. Um, and then if, if there's a surge in violence elsewhere, then we will, we will move them. So it provides that top layer of capacity so we can surge into to different areas. That, that's, that's the key, the key difference is a centrally brigaded resources to deal with issues and then the violent suppression units are always local. And essentially they would be targeted into community hotspots, areas that have a propensity for eye violence, it's whether it's a deterrence or whether it's a, you're being a, a community asked, because I'm, I'm aware of some interventions where either elected representatives said we want to see more policing in an area because of a distinct activity that's going on that could lead to violence and, and members of the community asking for that. Is that correct or is the tasking always done from a policing point of view or, or does local government have a role in that tasking? Um, so it, it's, large, it's largely done based on where we're seeing the violence trends. So um, the, the, VC, the VCTF is always asked for by BCUs mm. um, be, because Again, they've been on a, drain, a journey and I think they work very strong in engagement, but they, they don't know the work sites as well as everyone else. But we will often say to a BCU, look, uh, we, we can't go for this three months because in actual fact the violence is surging higher in this area, so we've got to go to that area. Um, so, again, demand out, outstrips supply. It would be great to have a bigger VCTF or bigger VSUs, but uh, it, okay. that central coordination that I lead on will be driven by where we're seeing the peak in violence. And, and largely, the VCTF works on public place violence, not, not stuff that happens in the house, domestic abuse or child abuse. Now, in the a previous administration, we asked a number of questions to your senior officers, including the commissioner, about some of the work of the violence suppression unit. So last year, I got a distinct impression, might be the area I live in, there was a very high visibility and a very proactive uh, policing element, more visible than normal. 
in terms of uh, the probably in the heat wave of the first COVID period uh, around that. There was some unfortunate social media activity. I don't want to go into the detail of that because that's one of my colleagues is going to ask a question around SOP and search. We had a high profile number of uh, social media activity. And then I distinctly got the impression that there was a pullback from some of the activity of the violence suppression units uh, in a different way. Is that correct or is that not? Have I got that completely wrong, what I was seeing on the ground? Uh, so I, I don't know the specific example you've spoken about. If it was the violence suppression unit, they will not leave the area, but they might have moved to a different part of the area if there was a necessity to, to deal with something else in that area. And as I mentioned, if it was the Violent Crime Task Force, they go on one month and three month deployments and it may be that they finished there uh, and they moved on to another area. We, we might come back to this again in the second question. I don't want to preempt my, my colleague's question around stop and search. Could, could, could we, we look could, at the stop and search trends. My, my, my next question then is really going back to that community engagement. So when we asked and we asked evidence around uh, there was a launch of the violence suppression work via a press release. The mayor was quoted, the commissioner was quoted uh, in that work. I asked a question to the Commissioner about what extra work over and above had we done with the communities that some of these, these probably what you would call micro spots, hot spot communities, over and above the usual suspects. No disrespect to that, but the, the, the normal uh, engagement activities the Metropolitan Police does to explain to people what was going to go on in their areas. It was a bit more high profile, a bit more in your face, a bit toe to toe, that of course those critical encounters would lead to different impressions of, you know, it's not nice if you're being asked uh, to account for yourself or, or being stopped and searched. I can't think of a more intrusive issue about it. It's the way it's done and how it was done. Now, so in lessons learned, uh, and going on, I was told, well, I think we were informed as a committee, there was an ongoing conversation about that. The communication process to try and engage with ordinary members of the public who may be seeing things going on and may be questioning, well, why ain't the police intervening of going on? I'm not involved in my local ward panel. I don't do the community safety board. I don't understand what the council does. I'm an ordinary member of the public. What steps did you think would the police have done better in some of those areas of bringing people on, going back to a bit like policing by consent? Well, I'm a big supporter of this work, but equally I think there were some weaknesses about how it was done in the beginning, and hopefully that you're going to try and take that learning on. But is that an active discussion within the Met yeah, about it's, those it's issues? It's a huge area of, of focus for us, and you're, you're right, we can... We can in engage and build relationships better. Um, and we have a commander who leads on that for us, uh, Commander Ali Hadari, uh, uh, who, who really wants us, and, and a relationship is two way as well, isn't it? It's not the police saying we're coming here and that we're motivated to reduce violence, but it's, uh, it, it's doing that in, in a really constructive way. I think at, at the officer level, and you, you rightly highlight how stuff is done is really important, um, and that, uh, engagement with an individual if they're going to be subject to stop and search could go one of two ways. Um, I, I don't know if you can forgive me the, the opportunity to tell a story uh, around... Uh, Sorry, Commander, I'm, I'm going to stop you there because okay. we, we, we have a serious time restriction. But what I am going to say, I didn't particularly hear an answer to what additional work is being done, if additional resources being put in a particular area by the police. And I think there's something there that really needs to be looked at. Because on the one end, additional police resources is a great thing, but its impact on the ground may look different. So there's a piece there. But we will write to you about that and have a conversation offline. And we have a, another opportunity in our work programme to pick that up. Can I just, can I just say, Chair, that uh, we actually have performance indicators around the points that Len is talking about. So, you know, ride-alongs. Um, the uh, people watching the body-worn video in relation to stop and search, we, we are trying to really push that. So we are learning lessons and we are focusing huge amounts of effort there. I, I see that. I, it sounds to me that Ned was talking about preemptive work, not reactive well, work. I'm but but, but, but sorry, Ned, Chair, I don't, I don't want to pick up. Just very quickly, Chair, what I'm trying to say is, look, you're the number one agency tackling crime. There's no getting away from that. That's where it is. 
actually in tackling crime you need a number of other people to come to play and surely the community is a key part in that and if you're going to come into my area and I'm just going about my normal daily business I don't want to know what you politicians are up to I don't want to know with that but if you're going to come to my area and I might have a view of about what's going on in my area shouldn't I be told shouldn't I be told what to expect and why you're doing it in a general way rather than maybe the critical encounter that I might have at uh, 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 later in the night. Isn't there some issue about, we're all in this together, old phrase, not my phrase, but in that sense, of taking people with you in terms of tackling crime. I think people are fed up with a small number of people that are disproportionately wrecking our communities in that sense, and they want to see some action. And the trouble is, I'm fed, if I'm an ordinary member of the public, by what I might see in the media, what I might see in the social room chat rooms, what I might see is that five minute clip it of where the police might not be doing it in the way that I feel comfortable with. And therefore that might actually um, prejudice me about what I think about is going on there and whether it's fair or reasonable about what's happening in my community. C Commander, not politely, we'll pick this up offline because I have serious time restriction here. Can I move on to Assembly Member Hall? Okay, um, he said to you, Commander, <coughs> sorry. Um, and it follows on from what Len was saying, really. Um, what is the positive outcome rate for stop and searches by the, uh, the violence suppression units? Uh, it's uh, the stop and search rate um, of which the violence suppression unit VCTF do uh, probably the most with the territorial support group as well. I know that I know the number for all it, all of stop and search for London. It, it's a, the positive outcome rate is about twenty three percent. So that's rising then yes. from what it used yeah, to. Yeah, and, and and we uh, we want that to increase all, all the time. And and again, you know, we want to be people driven, not not data driven. But we're talking many thousands of knives, you know, 450 knives circa every month taken off the streets with stop and search. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that if they weren't taken off the streets, one or two or many of those would have been used to stab other people. So, yes, the outcome rate is 23 percent. Some of that's knives, some of that's drugs. Um, but I, I think it is is having an impact. We'd, of course, like it to be much higher. Yes. Um, I do, of course, we can never gauge how much of a deterrent it is to stop people bringing them out in the first place, which I think is a shame because um, that would show the worth of Stop and Search more. Do you think that um, <clears throat> people not having carried a knife through the lockdowns will make them more likely to come out with knives or less likely? Um, I, I, I think this is one of the biggest issues for violence in London is knife carrying in public places. Uh, if we look at, um, so, so this year from January, um, the 23 under 25 year olds who've been killed, um, the majority of those have been killed with knives. Um, um, the majority of murders in London are with knives. Uh, and we're seeing younger and younger people carrying knives. And you've seen it in some of the social media clips that have gone viral over the last a uh, couple of weeks. This is an issue that we've all we've all got to get to grips with, and, and this is where stop and search comes in as one way of getting to grips with it. Education, another way. But uh, if you were to ask me around public place violence, what my biggest concern is, it is young people carrying knives, uh, and, and we know young young people uh, are much more likely, if you carry a knife, to be subject to violence with a knife, and that that causes me a huge amount of concern. Tell me. Um of the knives that are, um, are taken off these um, youths, etc., are most of them kitchen-type knives that could be bought anywhere? Or are you seeing an increase in knives that are on the internet? So, I mean, some of the ones that I've seen are just horrendous. I wouldn't know where to get a knife like that. Yeah, so uh, so every day I'm sent pictures of the knives that, w that we seized. VSU, since they started in May 2020, have seized 770, and the VCTF, 2,600 knives taken, uh, taken off the streets. Um, but we're also doing warrants where we're understanding who is supplying some of the knives uh, and uh, taking out hundreds of knives uh, at, at a time. And they, they vary considerably from the horrific type of zombie knives that you've seen uh, we've seen machetes uh, pretty common over the last uh, couple of months. But a significant proportion of knives we take are kitchen knives or uh, just handheld knives clasped down 
um, that don't look particularly, you know, that some of us might have in our toolboxes, for example. Um, so, so there is a complete, uh, complete variation. Okay. <coughs> what action is the Met taking to respond to the recent spate of knife crimes, um, including, of course, that shocking attack that occurred in front of so many people in Hyde Park? What, what other things are you doing? <clears throat> so um, we've just finished operation. So, so we're always focused on knife crime. If, if you're going to tackle violence, we've got to tackle knife crime. And we, but we surge in different times. So we've just completed Operation Scepter, which is a bi, uh, uh, biannual operation to tackle knife crime. Again, uh, a week-long operation, nearly 1,000 arrests, 411 knives taken off the streets. That's being in high knife crime areas, um, uh, it's working with trading standards, it's going into shops, uh, it's going into schools. So it is the fuller array of both enforcement but also education and engagement. Um, so that is an example of something we do, Operation Scepter, to specifically tackle knife crime. And, you know, there's quite a lot that NGOs and community groups also do, which is hugely welcome in relation to tackling knife crime. When you see a, a really young person with, with a knife, do you ever get, take them back to the parents and, and show them what they've got? Y yes, well, so uh, if we catch a young person with a knife, they're going to be arrested, and rightly so. We've, we've just finished Operation Guardian, which in actual fact is when we have a young person who's involved in, in violence, they come into a custody block, and they are shown the consequences, uh, and their parents or parents or guardian are brought in and shown the consequences of knife crime, and it's followed up with texts afterwards. Um, so that's an example of how we're trying to do the education at the same time as the enforcement and, and clearly uh, divert works for eight, over 18 year olds. There's, a, there's another uh, under 18 year old uh, sort of intervention which isn't Pan London yet but it's called Engage which does the same thing for under 18 year olds in custody blocks. Um, so, uh, and our school, safer school officers have knife crime right up high on their agenda. Um, but it, it, is, it is a really, you know, it's a wicked problem around how you stop young people carrying, carrying knives. And we, we can't be everywhere all the time. Um, and it's a challenge for us. Absolutely. In general, when the parents see what the child has, has done, are they, in general, are they shocked that their child should do this? Because most of us think our own children aren't the, you know, the most innocent, wonderful people in the whole world. I can't be the only one that thinks that. So are they shocked or are they aware that they're uh, doing this sort of thing? Uh, uh, well, I might ask some of my colleagues to my right who have better experience in engaging with the parents, but when I sat down with a, a, a young offender during the first lockdown in one of those visits with his dad, uh, there, uh, he was not shocked, but he was also supportive of his son, and his son was actually trying to turn his... Uh, life around and I think there will be a complete spectrum of sort of parental response from um, being really shocked through to not being surprised through to sometimes uh, sadly not caring so it's going to it's going to be that whole spectrum but can, can, can I move this on please sorry can I can I can I speed this up so sorry yeah, it's okay. I'll be very quick on the last one um, <clears throat> is there anything else command you want to tell us about tackling youth homicide is there anything else that you would particularly like to? So we, we review uh, every homicide and look at lessons learnt. Um, youth homicide um, is not equally spread across demographic groups or the geography of London. Um, I think it, it affects the black community, youth homicide, much more than any other community. Uh, it is incredibly disproportionate. Um, uh, and we should, and I am shocked by that and are motivated to do something about it. Um, so, so it, Commander, can, can I just, when you say incredibly, um, it, it, what's the disparity? I'll be talking it. So 23 of the last people, so since, <coughs> since January this year, yeah. uh, 56 homicides, 23 have been under 25s, and of those under 25s, 17 uh, of them have been black young people so really hugely disproportionate um and we are all m motivated to to change that and bring the homicide rate down thank you thank you for that C can i move on please thank you. Um, okay i was going to pick up on that um 
everybody else very briefly then and um, what is working and what more needs to be done in your view i mean clearly the police are doing what they can but is there any angle of where where you see these issues you think if only they could do this or that i start i'm not quite sure in terms of you know i think what the police are doing is is trying to change as i say that kind of public relation and that needs to continue i would like to see more kind of action from the community itself you know the yeah. community are independent um i'm from the 70s i know that the hackney <clears throat> that i grew up in doesn't exist anymore i had a community when i lived in hackney because the whole borough was one we all played in the same areas but actually that that borough now has been chopped up into different little postcodes by what's going on in terms of the criminal activity in this territorial business. Now, for me, when I was younger, the community had much more involvement. And when I say community, I mean elder people in the, in, in, in the area, people that you, know, you, you grew up around. Um, there needs, for me, to be some kind of community initiative that comes from some of the elders in the community to say, actually, we need to start trying to bridge that gap uh, with our young, our young people, not just our own children, but with the, the, the young people in the community itself. Do you think young people have has got as much respect for their elders as maybe a generation ago? No, they, they, they don't. But actually, it's about an education because a lot of the times when I'm speaking to them in custody, you know, they're, they're very respectful um, because I'm having that dialogue with them. I'm recognising their voices. A lot, of, a lot of my generation, I would say, don't really understand the world that, that young people live in. That's, that's one thing. So it's about giving them that space for them to educate us because I think there is this assumption that, oh, you know, the younger generation have got, got it all. They've got, they've got everything at their, their, their fingertips. But actually... I, I don't envy them growing up in this, in this way, in this, in this time. I think that there is so much pressure coming from media, marketing, schools. You know, it's coming from everywhere. And actually, I think there's a lot of confusion that's going on with how our young people are coping in general in, in society today. And I do think we, as, as a community, have a responsibility to, um, you know, to give them some sort of safer platform to approach us, to, to have that dialogue with us. And do you think it's more difficult for the black community, taken what the commander was saying? Do you think there are other issues in there? Because we need to face this straight on and see what we can of, do. Of course, you know, and it is an elephant in the room. You know, a lot of the times um, I might be speaking to a parent of a client that I've met and I have to educate that parent on the fact that this is actually about the police trying to, you know, prevent as opposed to just enforce. So in order to change that attitude or to check or to address some of those issues that the elder community have, we need a space and a forum to be able to have those discussions. You know, if I was walking past a local community and it said, you know, please come in and, and talk about the issues in the community. I'd, I'd, I'd go in there straight away. Some of the young clients I've spoken to and said to them, you know, how would you feel about being involved in some kind of community reasoning session? They said, yeah, you know, yeah, we, we, we'd like that. Because we're just, we're just not talking to each other. We're talking to each other in isolated yeah. incidents in our homes. But as a community, young people are not seeing the, the, the elders get together and start trying to address, okay, what's happening with, with you guys? We don't understand why you'd feel the need to carry that particular knife. Why don't you explain to us where you're coming from? Well, that, that's interesting, because we've got to get to the bottom of it. Uh, Henry, is there anything that you could see that could be changed to make this better? I personally feel, I mean, from a, an operational point of view, investing in pro programmes like Divert um, is a very good investment, because what we're able to do is have that conversation um, at a very early point where it's one-to-one -one and we can explore what the issues are with that young person. I think following on from that, it's really important then to have a, a really good relationship with the parents, with the parents of that young person as well, just to explore what the family life is, what the home life is, and see what interventions we can enforce to help them. I also believe that we need to build relationships with the wider community. We need to pull together as a community. 
which is something that we are definitely... Sorry, that's my timer. Let me know that we have a serious overrun issue. <laughs> Sorry. If, if any of our guests do need to leave, please take it up. But if you don't, I'd like to suggest we, 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 we keep going. Because for me particularly, this is the most interesting part of the conversation. What do we do within our communities to empower our communities to take some charge of what's going on? So, so I'd like to continue, if at all possible. And of course, some of my members would, would really like to continue as well. I, I just want to slightly short circuit you, Susan, so that I can move on because we are. I think, Chair, we've got at least two hours. Well, I've I've got an hour in, in here. <laughs> okay, I've been informed by our committee, so let's we're, keep going. We're all very deep into. Well, this. let's keep going. Then. Can I just? Yeah. Oh, oh, I, I, I thank you for that. Can I just say then, Anthony? I'd really like your take on Susan's question when it comes to. Thank you. You saw. Um, thank you, Chair. What a privilege um, to be in a room. Um, see you in person, Chair, is a good thing. Uh, thank you. Hearing our voices is, 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 is very key. My response to you, um, Susan, my response is this. In a challenging area of Croydon, where we've been dubbed the epicentre of crime, we have a hub in the middle of the, of the area called the CVA. We had young people that would never engage with the Metropolitan Police due to trust issues. We had to speak to these young people intently as to why they have the feelings that they do. Some of them highlighted, they've seen their friends arrested, they've seen what's happened when their brother has died, they've been at the scene and seen uh, loved ones pass away. We had to challenge some of their understandings through their cultural understanding of grandparents didn't like the Met, because back home where some of us come from, the islands of Jamaica and places like that, sadly you're referred to as Babylon. In addition to that, we had to help the young people understand we had to help young, uh, young people understand that we need to partner with the Met to reduce some of the issues and some of the traumas that they're facing due to knife crime and things like that. We have tremendous organisations like Divert that work in the borough of Croydon too, who also highlighted that we need to get everybody around the table, not only the children from the Boys Brigade background, the affluent areas of Croydon where they have cadets and things like that, but get to the grassroots um, of the community, get to the areas where children are hanging around outside of chicken and chip shops and barber shops and start to understand their truths and understand why is it that they have to carry knives and why is it that they feel that they have to carry knives for protection. We had to start looking at the traumas that some of these young people face. The fact that we have a hub in the heart of the epicenter of where the crime is, we've been able to invite the young people who would never have a conversation with the Met to come into the room. The power of being in a room is that we have the BCU that now have the air of the young people and vice versa. It, would t it had to take some really challenging conversations with leadership in the Met to say, listen, some of the challenges that we as black people face with policing, we had to have real conversations. We had to have conversations such as, where are you from? Some of our senior leaders said they're from Ashstead and Leatherhead and Box Hill and surrounding areas. What is your understanding of policing young black kids? One officer turned around and said, my influence was by watching boys in the hood. And that was their understanding of the young black community and then they're having to police in areas where in Croydon 52.3 percent are BAME and you're having to police in those areas with some of those historic prejudices then we had to address some of the young people about their prejudices regarding the Met because a lot of young people didn't see officers as human beings they saw it as an establishment a gang sometimes they've had issues where TSG have turned up on the scene looking like Robocop <laughs> and you know they've been intimidated by that and we've also had to have sessions at the Warren where we've had to ask questions, Sean, of number one, how many of our peers in the room, white peers in the room, grew up with a mother and father? Out of 40 officers, 35 of them put their hands up that they grew up with a mother and father. Then we asked the 14 young black men that were in the room, how many of you grew up with a mother and father? None put their hands up. Many of them, their, their stories, it was only their mother. So the first voice they'd ever hear is section 60, Sop and Sturch. The first authoritative voice, because they don't hear a male voice in a primary school, very rarely hear one in a secondary school, because some have been excluded already, is when they're shouted at, stop and search. At the point of that conversation, realities had hit home. Officers became tearful because they realised that's the story of many young black males. And young black males also understood that some of the officers weren't educated as to how to communicate with young black males, because the first thing they perceived is aggression. The first thing they saw was the hood. And Sean, we've had to, myself, Steve, and tremendous professionals in the borough, 
have had to create a safe space and environment every Friday where we brought leadership from your team every Friday who are consistent, your borough commanders consistent every week, superintendent consistent every week. And we have the road young people in the room. Some of them still don't smell savoury. They still smell like they've got a couple of issues and herbal substances, but they're in the room. And the conversations are real, Sean. We have the head of the youth offending service in the room also. We have politicians in the room also because everyone wants to get to the kernel of the situation. And thankfully, because your officers invested time, had to sit down and have real conversation with our young people, our young people have now built a relationship that is public. It's, it's all over BBC, all over Channel 4, about the positive relationships that have happened. We have an organisation, Sean, that you've probably heard of called Forever Family. Now, I don't politically endorse their, their, their stance, but they felt that they needed to police their community because they felt that trust was breached. They turned up to our meeting last week, Sean, in their numbers, and decided to tell their story of why they do not trust the police. I'll finish my point on quoting a young black male who, last, this time last year, didn't want any interaction with the Met. His quote was, Sean, the narrative that these young boys have from forever families speaking so negatively about the Met Police across London, our young person said, that is not reflective of our feds. Our feds are cool. His point is, our police officers in Croydon are cool. Sean, it took for the police to start listening. It took for the police to start inviting the young people into the spaces where their voices can be heard. And it took for your colleagues to invite real young people, not the cadet crew, the street young people that only eat chicken and chips, to come and sit down and speak to your officers about how to have a conversation with the black community. So can That's I, powerful. So can I go back to the question, is, is it disproportionate in the black community, this dislike for the Met? Do you, would you say that? I think you've got to take into account, um, I'm, I haven't asked Sean what his background is yet, but I can tell you culturally, and for many in the room, especially um, the ladies here, culturally we've got historic hate for the Met. Um, because in our, with our grandparents, my grandparents' generation and my parents, you never spoke to the Met. You never had a conversation with the Met. They weren't even called the police. So because of historic issues, some of it has been passed down through generations. And that's why the young people, some of the young people have such a negative perception of the so Met. So you think it is more dispro disproportionate in the black community? 100%. OK. So do you see it in any other communities? Because you obviously work with... Lots of young kids. Yes. Any, are there any other communities that the Met need to be looking at to see if they can do things in a different way? 100%. Uh, last week we did an event, um, an anti-knife crime event, um, that got uh, tremendous media attention, um, where we had to invite the unaccompanied asylum seekers. One of the biggest challenges we have on London Road in Croydon at the moment is the rise of unaccompanied asylum seekers that are selling cannabis due to no recourse to public funds, um, challenges around, you know, immigration statuses. Um, some of them can't be accommodated. So the unaccompanied asylum seekers, you're talking about your Kurdish community, your Afghan community, your Albanian community. They're also finding that because they're from war-torn countries where officers walked around with guns, they've got an automatic fear for the Met. So some of them, in, in a quote in our meeting on Friday by a young man who's from uh, Uganda, he said the reason why he doesn't talk to police officers is because where he's from, they all walked around with guns. So why are they disproportionately, black guys in particular, why are they disproportionately carrying knives to other youths? Why is that? It, it can't just be their relationship with the men. No. Why is it? No, you've got, sadly, um, you've got the breakdown of the home, which um, through the public health approach uh, has highlighted certain concerns and challenges. But the breakdown of the home, a lot of young people feel that they need to be in a position to defend themselves because they feel like they can't be defended, whether it's by the Met or an older in the community or somebody they look up to has possibly been injured due to knife crime or incarcerated due to carrying knives. So some young people sadly feel that they have to carry a knife to protect themselves. Also, I'd hasten to add, Susan, that we've heard a lot of narratives out recently about abductions in the community. Many of them were false um, information that was going out through WhatsApp, social media, Instagram and things like that. And we also became aware that there's some young people that for fear, they'll carry a knife. Um, whilst we don't agree with it, we don't celebrate it. And I'd prefer, 
I personally prefer that officers arrest and take young people off the streets who carry knives. But you've still got that challenge that a lot of young black males feel like the only way they can defend themselves because mum, who, who, mum who's, who's only on nine pounds an hour has to work shift work, she's hardly home. And a 12 year old's got to look after an 11 year old and a seven year old in the house and also very privy to gang culture. Some of these young people feel that carrying a knife is a safe way to defend themselves. It's frightening, but it's their reality. Okay, thank you for your views. Very briefly, then, Steve, what, what are your views? Are they exactly the same? Well, we met with the borough commander on Monday, and, and he said, well, I wonder what the collective ask is going to be. What he said, Sean, is let us carry on doing what we're doing. This isn't just about cutting crime. It's about doing it the right way. So that's through building partnerships. And to go back to that point about residents, how do you bring them along? You know, you're not going to do it by walking up and down the road and having a few conversations. You know, we've got the London Road Business Association, which the police have engaged with systematically. And through our community organisations, you know, they're getting into uh, the community. So I think it has to be that long term approach, that sort of relationship building. Anthony mentioned the um, asylum seekers. Ref Refugee Week's coming up. Uh, we've got the police playing a team of uh, young guys at cricket one day, football the next. Thank you. It, it's, OK, a couple of days of, of, of fun, but it's actually the relationship building because they're giving those young people a chance to speak to police officers. OK, we're, we're hearing loud and clear it's more work in, in the community. And I think the police would say they cannot possibly do this on their own. They do need communities to assist in all of this. I'll leave it there. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Um, now that I have all the time in the world, just quickly. Uh, very quickly, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, Anthony, your, your, your narrative there, it was incredibly moving. I actually felt very emotional when you were talking about the war in which I know incredibly well and, and what's happening there. I'm an exceptionally big fan of peer-to-peer -peer education. And what I'd like to know from you, but from you as well, Commander Murray, about uh, with, within the Met as well, where that peer-to-peer -peer education is happening with your young people. So you're talking about 14 young men who were there. What conversations are they having with their friends? And Commander Murray, the people who, uh, the officers who were part of that training, and I'm sure that that happens across the Met as well as from Box Hill, Leatherhead and the rest of Surrey, um, what kind of conversations they're having and what kind of, uh, you know, how, how do we measure this as well? How, how do we see what effect this is happening? I asked, thank you for the question. I asked um, the uh, superintendent and he will get me the information by the end of the week. Based on, since we've started training um, the Met at the Warren, especially the, uh, the VSU guys, since we've been training, I think we've trained about 140 officers. Um, and these are young black men that are going in and speaking their truths. Um, since we've done that, I want the stats as to the impact it's had on stop and search. I want the stats as to, since you've had 14 young black males who've turned up to train their officers in track suits as opposed to shirts, I want to know what impact has it had statistic-wise, number one. And number two, the narrative that is going back, um, we had an event, Steve. Uh, we had a young man that passed away in February, the latter part of February in Croydon. We put on an emergency event, circled, uh, centred around football, and we said we need to do a one-minute silence for the young man. We said to the young people, we will pay for everything. Um, this is before the Mayan funding came through, Steve. We will cover the cost. The Met agreed to meet at 50-50 on the cost in, um, and we had 95 young people, disadvantaged young people, participate in the event with a team from the Met Police. The conversations were incredible because some of the young people were speaking to the officers and saying to the officers, this is where we need to see the change. First time I've ever seen young black men hugging police officers when a goal went in. I, I've never seen that before. Uh, the first time was at the Warren recently. And in addition to that, the young people are going back and telling their peers. Steve is a tremendous uh, witness to the fact that in our weekly meetings, they're bringing more of their peers to the meetings. They're not turning up in a shirt smelling, of, smelling rosy. They're turning up because they feel that they have a voice and it can be heard. And that is the impact that it's having. It went from four young men playing five-a-side football in the park to 95 young men uh, and a couple of females participating in a massive conversation and a piece of engagement with 25 Met officers. That, that for me speaks volumes for itself. The young people are going back with the narrative. In addition to that, 
Um, the drill artists that there's some drill artists as controversial as it sounds they're number two in the UK pop charts at the moment there is extensive pictures with the drill artists and the Met Police because they're doing a piece of partnership work in training the Met how to understand drill music the impact that it has on gangs and culture and the guys that are doing this piece of work are number two in the pop charts they've got all of the pictures out on Instagram and UK gossip I'm getting old and I'm showing my age UK gossip and um it's had probably about 700,000 hits, but that's just because of the power of the partnership work and the conversations that are going out through social media as well. To say that, in quote of the young man, our feds are cool. Commander Murray, how is that affecting officers? I mean, what kind of impact is that having on officers and their behaviour? Well, I, th I think it's probably not dissimilar to the impact that Anthony's uh, speech or talk has just had on you. It had the same impact on me, and it, it's a bit like... A restorative justice session isn't it where everyone comes with their presupposed ideas and that's only when you sit down and engage with someone there's that pin drop moment where you you know the humanity of both sides is apparent to the other side and for too long the, the biases are built up and uh, so I mean I, I think it's been an incredible incredibly impactive all new recruits when they come into the Met they're posted into a particular community and they have something similar I, I mean I don't think it is as good as what's happening in Croydon and, and I think sure Anthony and others will say there's a long way to go in Croydon of course but there's uh, a huge way to go everywhere uh, in the Met uh, and I would like to see this last forever and grow and grow stronger but more than just Croydon you know in every borough and there's the kernels of that as we are trained by local individuals as young men come out on ride-alongs and witness stop and search um, and as they teach officers what it's like to be stopped and searched um, so I'm, am, I'm ambitious for it uh, and I want it to happen tomorrow but it's something that builds over a long period of time you can't come in and out on this it, it's it, uh, I, I think it's really impactful, and we want to do more and we want it to grow stronger um, I think there are uh, as we're talking about violence there are other community groups and it's a bit Susan's point really uh, where we have it's very hard to engage and I'm concerned so my previous role was in specialist crime human trafficking you know there's incredible violence within the Chinese community against Chinese women and I don't think our reach into the Chinese community is strong Vietnamese as well that human you know there are there are other communities where we Albanian Eastern European again a high homicide rate there really hard to penetrate and concerns about what happens back home so it, it you know the black community is key for us, but there are other communities as well that are subject to huge amounts of violence where we need to do something similar and, and penetrate them. And the, the, only, the other final comment is a uh, really impactive um, piece of media from five mums who've lost their teenage sons. Um, so it's not, you know, it's not the police talking, but it's talking about this is what happens if you carry knives. And police, it's called Hardcore Saves Lives. Uh, they've all been subject to a huge loss and I'd like to broadcast that here and everywhere because everybody should watch it very short video just mums talking about the loss they've had and please you know forget about your preconceptions about the police this is about saving people's lives as young people if you know someone's carrying a life make the call to Crime Stoppers which is anonymous uh, it's another form of engagement where the community is taking control and, and trying to make a difference I think. Sorry, so, do you so mind if just I before you go um, could you make that those details of that video um, yeah, of visible to the, to the to the committee, we'd we'd like to see that. And just before you answer, Anthony, what, what I the most powerful point of what you said is actually those young people taking responsibility. I've been a youth worker for over twenty years. I used to run a program called Score Against the Law. I yeah. used to play football with the police. You beat me though, because there was no hugging of the police <laughs> at the time. But but the point is, the point is the the real special thing that I said from the work you're talking about is not just making it the police's problem. Yes. It isn't just about police. Susan is correct. The, 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 the dislike, the distrust is, is biggest in the black community. That's yes. a tradition we learned to be a fact, but it also means we have the biggest responsibility yes. to do something about it. So I like the work, the work you're doing because you're asking those young people to take responsibility, not just to point the finger. I say this because now I'm inviting myself along to a session to come and see that. It's, it's very important <laughs> because I think the thing we need to do here is scale, but, but that's just me. Yeah. I want to quickly call in um, um, Assemblyman Duval. I, I think that some of the testimonies we've heard this morning are very powerful and are in the right direction. Because I remember Croydon, long before the BCU reorganisation, trying to stop 
drill music uh, right. uh, venues and all the rest of it because it was a lazy way of policing rather than engaging and trying to make people safer. So a bit of tough love because I think there's a majority here, I hope there's a majority here, about uh, stop and search as being a very useful tool for policing if it's done in the right way. So last year we had interventions from the inspectorate which was shocking I think. Uh, when they were looking at stop and search within the, the, the um, within the police, and then we had the mayoral intervention, which got the governance and scrutiny a bit of refocusing, which I think was appreciated by all sides around uh, around those issues. Um, I just wanted to, 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 to say, is it true? So I, I, I had a conversation with one of your colleagues. I think it might have been one of the informal police briefing issues. Or I questioned, and I, I raised it earlier on, and I wish I'd done a bit more research because I would have had the date. So it rose out of a period of time early last year when the stop and search figures were up there, and then they suddenly dropped down there. And it may have been to do with the social media activity that was going on and a number of complaints being made. And I suspect I've had some feedback the number of complaints didn't materialise in the way it was. And it's really capturing, you know, what you see on social media is the... It's a few minutes of something that looks bad rather than the four, 15, 20 minutes encounter, which doesn't look bad. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. you start to understand it. So I just really um, w want to understand is, are you in a, in a position around stop and search to say that you think you've got the processes right now? The issue is that body-worn cameras, which we were told were going to be the game changer, and would change that relationship between those that were being searched, those that were doing the search, is being correctly applied in these situations that we're going forward. And in that drop-off period, I was told that when we did less stop and search, actually, we had better outcomes. Is that correct? I, I, I can be corrected on this, but I don't think we've ever had an outcome rate as high as it is at the moment, nearly, you know, nearly one, in, one in four. Yeah. Um, so if, if I can add, um, amplify some of the points, so roughly 300,000 stops and searches uh, a, a year in the Met, um, and uh, you know, thousands of crimes solved as a result of it, but there are also uh, something like 1,800 complaints, uh, and disciplinary action by formal and informal is, is given as a result of that. One of the journeys we've been on, as you rightly point out, is body-worn video. Now, 97% of all our stop and search now is covered by body-worn video. It's a policy requirement. You turn it on. Um, a, you, as everyone knows, we need ground. You don't just stop and search anybody. We don't actually want to stop and search anybody, mm. but you need grounds. And with the body-worn video on, you've got to give the grounds. You've got to, and you, uh, it's one thing doing what the law requires, but also the body-worn video. People know that you can watch it and the sergeant can watch it and you can see, are you treating people with dignity and respect, even in a very confrontational situation? Yep. Because, you know, people uh, don't comply often with stop and search in a way that is amenable and for a whole set of uh, reasons sometimes under understandable. Um, and we call it procedural justice, but how are you demonstrating to the individual that your motivation is good? So you're, not, you're not this big state actor, power-hungry individual trying to minimise that you actually we're trying to stop people getting hurt that's what we're trying to get across and that's what we should always try and get in a stop and search uh, engagement is look we're not here to be a big brother or a bully we're here to take knives off the street because too many people are getting hurt and that so um we're learning a lot we're learning a lot from hearing the voices of young men who are largely stopped and search i there's we can do so much more uh, you know that that engagement that face-to-face -face learning um can be better uh, we can have it endemic across the whole of London and that's what we're seeking seeking to do uh, we will also make mistakes uh, and we will also stop and search wrongly sometimes because you know we're 40,000 strong um, and finally to your point on social media it is really it's it is really tricky um, the good thing about body worn video is that when someone sees something happening on social media and they go look that's out of order the Independent Office of Police Complaints can watch the body-worn video. They can see all the circumstances. They can see the conversation. They can see the grounds. And then they can make up their mind around, was, did something illegal happen? Or was there a misconduct or performance issue here? So that, so that is good from a transparency point of view. Unfortunately, though, we can't show the body-worn video out to meet the social media. You know, that, that, that would be the wrong thing to do for every bit of body-worn, uh, for every social media clip we put out the body-worn video. Anyway, we can't because it's private information about the individual. 
Um, so I think it's beneficial for our officers, beneficial for the people who are being subject to stop and search, and, and for the people who scrutinise us as well. But the trouble is, every time there's a critical incident that looks bad, that might not be bad, after an investigation, it sort of sets back some of that engagement activity that you're trying to achieve. What I don't understand with the Met stance, and again, we've asked questions to your senior officers, where there's no complaint, but there is someone who's posted a video the short snap but we know that the overall video isn't there we don't seem the met being very proactive to defend uh, the actions of officers on the ground that with the best intentions we're trying to do um, a difficult intervention at, 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 at you're in a challenging situation with a group of onlookers that don't, don't quite appreciate what's been going on so is that going to change as well a part of the mission to explain but where there's not a complaint. I understand if a complaint's made, why well, you wouldn't want to put into the public domain. That will go through and people will rightly, uh, it will be properly investigated and outcomes done. I get that. But some of the stuff that was posted on social media that portrayed the police in a bad light, there was no complaints ever made. But I didn't really see the police defend themselves. So, um, so a lot, of ch lot has changed in this space over the last year and we've got a, a quick turnaround policy to try and as much as possible reach uh, an audience to say this this has happened we're satisfied that nothing's gone wrong here and to put some proactive messaging on and it's got really quick now the issue around a complaint is sort of immaterial so if a viral image goes out of a stop and search that looks bad it doesn't matter that someone hasn't complained we will want to assure ourselves that something hasn't gone wrong so we we will speak to our professional standards dep department and say right as per the policy now quick term review get the body one video which we can immediately download do a quick review to say is there anything that has gone on. So it will be treated as if there, there was misconduct or there is, is there any learning that can come out of this. Sped up, uh, then back to our comms team to, to put something out. Of course, the reach of the Met and the Met comms, and we've got uh, some of the team here now, uh, might not reach the, the same audience that the viral images have, have gone mm. on. And, and the final point, and it gets to place to Anthony's point really, is that the me media is so hard to control. What, what we need is the trusting relationship so that when it goes out, uh, you know, local young men can have conversations with the officer going, what, what's going on here? You know, I trust you, what happened here? You know, that's when, the, that's when you can correct what people have seen on, on the video. Can, can, I, can I just move this on? But just to, just to Len's point, I actually think you're missing a trick here because you're never going to match viral media. That, that isn't the goal. The goal is two, is two phases. One, to support your officers so that what's being said about them publicly when it's incorrect, it's being challenged. And two, you will slowly start to change the narrative. Because what people do say, well, this is the internet's version of what's gone on. I wonder what the police are saying about what's gone on, because the police regularly try to defend their action in that sense. I think you might need to look at that again. The internet is very quick, but it's also very permanent. Mm -hmm. And people can compare things. It's very important, because I, I think, look, the public need to understand what happens in these encounters and that you've got to do it properly. Yeah. Equally, I don't want any officer thinking, I'm not going to do this because my bosses are never going to back me up yeah. in a difficult yes. situation yeah. because of the mixed messages that they perceive to go on. I don't think that's in the interest of good policing or our communities in many ways when we're tackling violence. And that's what worries me sometimes about some of that period of time last year. The ones that were wrong, we need to bring people to book. They need to be uh, account for their actions and be done. I expect that to be done properly, and do you rightly refer it to third-party investigations and people have got rights to complain about police action if they feel that it's not right and appropriate? And I expect that, we all expect that, to be done properly and appropriately. Where there is no case to answer, that I just wonder about how those officers felt by that process, where it's not being investigated, but they are judged as being guilty of something. Yeah, I and share, I, I share that concern right. too. And, and the new process we've instilled yeah. gives some really early engagement with that officer. So that, I mean, the, the body one video is there, so quick assessment, none of this waiting for months. Yeah. You're okay, it's going viral and you're getting lots of insults, but we are really content with what you did, thank you. you know, so our seniors are saying that, to, and I want that to happen to our officers. Yeah. Thank I, you. I, I think we're, I think we're, we're in accordance here, but the public representation of the defence of your officers is very important. Because if you go to Anthony's point, one of the powerful things about Anthony's point is that they're challenging the young people around their behaviour. This is another way to do it. And of course, if you want to up the levels of BAME people who apply 
to the Metropolitan Police, you have to have a public defence of the actions of the Metropolitan Police because that is the biggest step for that's the biggest step away for the black community. You will not join an organisation that seems to be attacking your community. If that organisation is making very clear what its actions are, you will feel like you could be part of that. It's, it's, it's an important long-term piece of work that the Met should be looking at, in my opinion. But anyway, I go on to my, I go on to my next assembly of Thank you. Oh. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to... Um, move us slightly on to talking about domestic abuse but before i do that i just wanted to reflect on something that you said um around um reporting and this year you've had uh lower levels of reports from victims of domestic abuse in no just un, un, un significant unchanged so still reporting but not a big uh, rise as okay, in sorry, reported my, complaints yeah, okay so i i guess um my reflection is just around um that, that there does seem to be a bit of a gap in terms of if uh, that has if people aren't coming forward whether they are um, black members of the community who are victims of crime rather than perpetrators or whether they are women who are victims of domestic abuse that um, I think you made a reference to uh, to being people led rather than data led I think that's kind of what triggered that or thought both, yeah yeah and so with the data led approach. I, I guess my concern would be that pe because people don't come forward, that 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 those crimes are not taken seriously until they escalate to something which is life-threatening, whether it's knife crime or close to being murdered by a partner in the home. Um, so that was my just my reflection. I'm just wondered if also for those people who are practitioners, um, what your thoughts might be in terms of filling that gap so people come forward and what the police could do to solve more of those low-level crimes before they become serious. But um, I just wanted to know a little bit more about the um, domestic abuse matters training and just the progress that you've made around that. If you could just talk us through some of that, it would be really helpful. Yeah, th thanks uh, for raising it. And, you know, we've largely spoken about violence that takes place in a public place, um, but nothing can be more corrosive, impactive, long-term for children in particular around domestic abuse. Um, so thanks for raising it. Um, again, a huge amount of effort. I... Uh, a colleague of mine, Commander Mel Dales, is the, the lead for uh, domestic abuse and other uh, violent crime in the home. She's, she's the person who speaks with more expertise than me on this area. Um, and what, what I would say, um, we want to build trust with people so that they can contact us. They know we will take it seriously. We have dedicated teams, as you know, that deal with domestic abuse. Um, and the last thing we'd want is for people not to call us because they don't they don't trust us or they don't think we will deal with it sensitively and properly um, and huge area of focus for us and so the DA matters training again really impacted you know it's you know it's Genesis uh, you know someone who's been a victim of uh, domestic abuse has worked hard on it and um, it is being rolled out across the whole of the Met I think you asked how is what how is the progression of that I actually do have a note on that I don't know it off the top of my head because this, is, this session has been largely about public place violence, but I can uh, find out for you, Sam, and get back to you. Okay, that'd be really helpful. So I um, I think that would be helpful. I'm a new to the committee, so I don't necessarily know the full That's fine. genesis of all of it. So that'd be good to have that here. And I guess off the back of that, I would like to just understand, obviously the domestic abuse bill is going through Parliament, and there's lots of additional responsibilities for the police in that. So things like protections for women and victims in the workplace as well as at home. Just wondering how you are preparing for that and if that would be rolled into your training. And I guess my second point is around just a reflection on the first bit of this conversation um, that how, what interventions are there in place for those people who, those young people who grow up to be victims of crime but potentially um, people that Anthony might meet who may themselves have at a younger age been kind of been witnesses to violence or low-level violence and in, in, in the home um, I guess my other reflection is that previously it was it felt like the interventions were at home sorry not at home at school or at youth clubs and what support is there for those young people to kind of avoid them if you like being brutalized without being dramatic to kind of think of that behavior as normal to support, I guess, the children of victims and the victims themselves. Yeah, I, I, I don't think you're being dramatic at all. It's one of the most acute adverse childhood experiences that we know 
affects people in, in uh, later life. Um, um, so the, this again, not my area of expertise, so I'd like to, to get someone back to you for that and perhaps it's an area that could be subject to scrutiny at a future PC, uh, PCC. Um, there are a huge amount of interventions. So A, we are, our DVPNs, our domestic violence uh, protection orders, um, have increased um, over 100% over the last year. It demonstrates that when we take no further action against somebody because of a whole series of issues, often because the victim can't or doesn't want to complain that we're still intervening to safeguard the individual and the children in that family. Um, and then there will be all sorts of referral pathways that uh, we will be engaged in. The key to this, of course, is the multi-agency safeguarding hub where um, we, people come together to discuss what's, from a child centre's point of view, what interventions can we make across the, across the board here. Uh, and then obviously the MARAC panels where we deal with a higher end of domestic abuse again where multi-agency prevention uh, and intervention uh, partnership to say what is it we can do with this family to prevent further harm taking place but um, you, you're right to highlight it 12 domestic homicides since the beginning of um, January this year in London um, and um, that, that's far too many okay if I could just come back with another question chair okay so just very quickly so we we started this conversation by saying that um, gang-related homicides are in single digits. And um, but in comparison, domestic violence and domestic abuse is not in single di digits at all. And I'm just wondering, with the levels of success in bringing perpetrators to justice for those families and those victims, I wonder what, through the domestic abuse matters training or those additional responsibilities you'll have um, once the bill passes, what more you can do to increase those numbers and just kind of, again, being a bit more successful in encouraging people to come forward and have faith in the police, much like the black community, those women to come forward to the police know that they will be believed and that their reports will be acted on. Mm. I'm just wondering what, what concrete steps you're going to take in that, and if you're not aware of that now, maybe to bring that back to a future committee, Chair. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think it would be good to bring it back to a future committee. Um, as, as, as you know, uh, each domestic homicide is subject to the Domestic Homicide Review, where all agencies look at learning around what could we have done to prevent this taking place. And I'm also aware nationally, you know, 50% of people who have been murdered from a, in a domestic homicide, it hasn't come to the notice of the police previously. Um, so it's... So if it's, I could just interrupt, I think, obviously you know better than me in terms of what hasn't, but the murder hasn't come to the notice of police beforehand but I guess my point is if people have reported low level issues to the police and the police have opened and closed a file or the police haven't acted on that report haven't sent somebody around to knock on the door and say stop it or something then we get to a point where it becomes a homicide and I'm just wondering in your training what what mitigations are there to avoid that happening yeah so I think it would be good for another PCC we we have dedicated domestic violence training uh, and the DA Matters training and a, a, a public protection panel chaired by an assistant commissioner that focuses on all these points uh, specifically. And if, if we look at the totality of violence in London, uh, excuse the governance, but uh, I lead on public place violence, uh, a counterpart, Mel, leads on private place violence and, and public protection. There are relevant areas of expertise, and, and it might be that in a future PCC we concentrate we, we, on the private uh, place violence. Thank you for writing our work program. Um, <laughs> we, we will come back to that we, when we when we look at our work program. We'll see where we factor this in. Clearly, the member has some questions that she wants answered, and we will look at it at a later date, Thanks, so Jeff. we can get much more detail. It's a very complex area that needs a special look. I, I would suggest. Right. So, if we could, um, shouldn't in a joined up met around it so we have response as the first probably call to a domestic violence situation we have specialized units and then we have other resources but surely shouldn't be one of the tasking issues whether on following up of some of these issues i'm thinking of the most prolific offenders uh, in terms of operation dauntless that you've got and also other criminality their violence isn't just towards the violence, and in some cases the young children in families, they're also in other, involved in other violent criminality. We've gone beyond trying to prevent uh, the issues, and there have been some case, cases, interesting cases, of particularly children being dying at the hands of these people. So the question then is, shouldn't you at some stage be tasking, jointly with your co 
colleague who's dealing with domestic violence to actually say, actually, violence suppression units across London, you need to support your specialist units who may well be understaffed and under pressure to go and knock on the doors of the most prolific offenders and track them down and find them if you can. Isn't that a reasonable issue? I mean, one of the creativities around the violent suppression units is your ability to coordinate and, have, and bring resources to bear in driving down this crime. And it is one of the strands of violent crime in London that needs a, a refocus in on, isn't it? Yeah, I, I think it does get a huge amount of focus and on each, so you have the violent suppression unit on each BCU, but you've also got the predatory offender unit on each BCU that is, that is focusing on if someone is wanted for, um, for violence in a domestic uh, view or a sex related violence, their whole purpose is to go and catch them and to get them or to work out what are we going to do to stop them doing this and you're right sometimes they'll cross over and it'll be someone committing violence in a public space and and at home in which case we will coordinate and work and work on those uh, individuals thank you okay. oh, thank you um, good morning to the panel uh, my questions um i'll have some later on are to representatives of divert and my ends um so if i could start off with um with yourselves, um, Anne Marie and, um, uh, and Rosalind, in terms of divert. Um, so, could you tell us how you are working with the MAT uh, and the Mayor's Violence Reduction Unit uh, to reduce violence uh, in London? I mean, what are your main priorities? And um, based on experiences, what are the most effective ways of preventing violence in London? And could you also give this committee a flavour of, of your work, you know, how, how you actually operate? How do we operate? Yeah. Okay, so, I mean, Ros can probably elaborate on this a bit more, but um, Divert operates, again, with the power of conversation. So when an individual is arrested, they're brought into police custody, and they're met by a custody intervention coach who will make them an offer um, to step out of the, the cell and go into a private consultation room where they can talk about opportunities, where they are now and where they'd like to be in the future, and how we can help them to obtain in that goal. So that's how the programme would work. Um, as I said, I don't know if you want to elaborate on yeah, the I mean, side of it. As I say, the whole point of, of having Diver in the custody suite is to not just be dealing with the enforcement side. It's, it's, it's trying to explain to that individual, you could take this opportunity, you know, in the middle of not even knowing what the outcome is yet. Because when I'm speaking to uh, clients in the custody suite, we have no idea whether they're going to be charged, bailed, released under investigation. So it's quite a task um, to get you know, people to visualise, or actually, I, I do have a choice here, but obviously it depends on, on the outcome. So it's, it's you know, explaining to them, take this opportunity to actually honestly look at the choices that you're making in life. You know, if you're coming into custody two, three times, then clearly something is not quite right. It could be a one-off, mind you. Um, a, a blip is what I call it. In terms of the domestic violence that, that, that has been raised, most of those cases sometimes are, are just a one-off. So it just might be a, a private conversation about, okay, coping mechanisms, how you're managing your emotions. Um, so it, it's really using that space in the custody suite to say, this is an offer that you can follow up on in the community and actually have some kind of impact on, 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 you know, on the outcomes. Yeah. But just so, to follow on from that, it's an offer that is open-ended. So just as much as they might, may be in custody today and they leave, it doesn't mean that they can't, at a future date, make contact with the service mm. where we could then uh, rekindle that relationship and continue. And just to touch on the point about domestic abuse, um, one of the things that we found as a programme is that there was a spike in domestic abuse with, with our client base. Um, and what New Era Foundation have done, which is the delivery um, arm for the Divert programme, is to adapt our IT system, where we can actually flag up victims and perpetrators at the earliest point 
and tried to put in some form of uh, intervention um, right at the beginning. So, and so also, sorry. we've invested in a we're investing in an uh, e-learning platform as well, just to educate individuals on healthy relationships and what domestic abuse actually looks like, because as we know, it, it can show itself in various signs. So it's to also <coughs> highlight that as well. <coughs> Just before you yeah. move on, could I ask one very quick question? What proportion of young people, young adults, take up the offer? Is it one in every ten, five in every ten? That um, well, I mean, we since the programme started, we've seen 1,262 individuals, and of that, 789 of them have gone into training, education, or employment. Of what period is that? 1,000. That's since 2015 until present. Even through the um, COVID, we was, the numbers were significantly reduced. The so COVID had a massive impact on how the programme actually operates in custody. And we had to heavily rely on remote referrals from the custody sergeants within custody. Um, so the numbers were reduced down to about 500. And we just had to adapt the way that we worked with those individuals because we couldn't physically get into custody. A lot of our work was over the phone, over video, and so forth. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so, I mean, just to move on, I mean, uh, I mean, how do you work with the, with the Mayor's Violence Reduction Unit itself, and also, obviously, working with offenders that you already told us about, okay. and also working with the police, but can you give us some more examples of how we actually work day to day with the police? How we work with the police? And the Violence Reduction Unit, yeah. Okay, so with the Violence Reduction Unit, they actually fund the Divert Programme, um, and we've just ref ref received the pot of funding where we're now able to expand our footprint across um, 12 custody suites within London, which are, I mean, we're currently in Brixton, Lewisham, but we're going into um, Leighton, Croydon, Hampstead and Fulham, Freshwolf and Holborn. So we're going to be able to expand our footprint. Um, as, and in addition to that, we're also able to work with football clubs that represent those areas as well. So, as we were talking about earlier, building relationships with the communities, we're actually doing that through the football clubs, through the power of sport. Uh, with, with regards to the Met, as I mentioned earlier, there's been a massive culture shift, and Diver actually started in 2015 at Brixton Police Station. So, we are fully embedded within that custody suite. We've got a very good relationship with the Met Police, um, and they, they support the programme immensely. Anything to add? I think, I mean, I've been at Wood Green now for two years, just over two years. So the main significant changes, I think, in the last year has been, you know, Diver in general being um, talked about a lot more within the teams of the Met because I am now getting uh, teams approaching me to say, look, you know, we, we, we know about Diver, we're... Um, we've got the business of arresting gang nominals um, you know how can we kind of feed into that in, into your service so internally I mean the Met is huge I didn't appreciate what, what, what uh, you know the size of the establishment when I first started but there are definitely lots of different teams there's the um, the IOM I don't know if you're familiar with, with that as well the independent offending Offender. Management. management team as well um, you know there are all these there are about two or three different teams at the moment that are definitely um, going to be sharing a lot more of the information about the people that they have you know the, the repeat offenders so it is it is growing internally and I think that those those relationships that I've worked to build really that is key to again trying to get more people engaged with, with Diver and as Anne-Marie said locally you know I have it is my responsibility to find out about local provision and to build those partnerships so the fact that I'm based in Wood Green in Haringey you know I have quite a close relationship with, with, with Tottenham uh, Tottenham uh, Football Club who have a community side a community mm. provision where they are really trying to reach you know yeah. hard to reach people so that relationship is is key um, so it is it is about that finding the balance between developing you know relationships in the community as well as in the Met as well mm. so um, 
One of the things this committee is, 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 is so concerned about, not just in this area but other areas, is outputs and how we actually evaluate performance. Um, and a lot of money is going into divert, quite rightly. I know the mayor announced 900,000 pounds on the 30th of May, 2021. Um, um, and I've got a question to ask of you, Commander. But uh, in terms of relationship with the Violence Reduction Unit to fund you, so I mean, you, you, do they ask you for reports of specific performance indicators? How many people actually have, you know, have been diverted away? Um, Certainly. In I mean, what I, what, did, what I want is a flavour of what sort of monitoring there is, you know, it's a two-way process, but uh, how do they actually actively interact with you in terms of, you know, what, monitoring your performance? I mean, from so, an sorry, I was going to say from an individual yeah. point of view or from a custody coach, obviously we submit weekly reports and mm. those reports are broken into how many people you actually uh, see in custody, how many people that you may have just given advice, information, advice and guidance how many people are actually going into training, how many people are going to employment. So as custody coaches, we're feeding in our data into what I presume is a wider report that the senior managers then feed into the BRU, yeah. and we can elaborate on that. So all of those, all the information that we obtain from the CICs would give, an, as I said, a breakdown of how many of those individuals have received information, advice and guidance, which could be anything from applying for benefits, CVs, um, mentoring, how many of those individuals have then gone into employment, sustainable employment, and how many of those individuals have gone into training. And all those figures are collated um, and sent up to, in a quarterly report to the VRU, we will then assess all of that information. In addition to that, we, um, are also be we've also been evaluated by the College of Policing and we're still awaiting the final outcome of that report. So once I'm in receipt of that, I'm happy to share that well, with you. That was my question to the commander, actually, that uh, the College of Policing started a program to evaluate divert. Yeah, that's uh, right. And it was due to complete in January 2021. Yeah. Are you able to share in, I mean, it's not been complete. Co no, we haven't received the results as yet. Okay, but I'm fine. happy to share it once we're in receipt of it. Yeah, okay. Right, J just before we you move on, when you received your funding, did they give you any idea of the, of the outcomes in, in monetary terms, sorry, in numbers terms or in quantitative terms that they were after? Yes, yeah, so because we're able to expand or we're currently underway of expanding our footprint across the 12 custody suites, we're hoping that we'd see by the end of the year about 1,500, so perhaps five a week um, at each of those custody suites. Okay, thank you. Chair, I'm conscious of the time, but before I move to my ends, um, I mean, any general sort of experiences in terms of the most effective ways of preventing violence in London? Uh, anything that you can share with us um, in terms of the way forward? For me, what I found is definitely that power of conversation um, and speaking to the individuals and really getting involved with the local community, reaching out to the families, involving them in the process as well. Because I feel that when you have a two-pronged attack, and you're not just working with the individual but with the wider family, it's a lot more effective. That was certainly my experience. Sure. Okay. I'm conscious of time. I'm, I could go on and on. Okay. So can I put the same sort of set of questions to you, um, um, Steve and Anthony? Uh, and in particular, so I mean, basically, how have you work with the MET and the Violence Reduction Unit? You've already given us some idea. Your priorities um, and the most effective ways of preventing violence in London but also if you could tell us a little bit about the specific activities uh, that you undertake. You, you talked about London Road, the work around London Road, because our briefing note says, and um, this doesn't just apply to you, there's limited information available about specific activities that take place in each consortium. That's so it's a London-wide sort of assessment. So anyway, a number of questions there in a few minutes. Just can, yeah. well, I, I think minutes, that yeah. whole family approach that you just mentioned is so key, isn't it? And it, it's at the heart of the VRU's public health and contextual safeguarding approaches. And just to give you a, a, a real example of that, um, you know, we're, we're investing a lot in mentoring and organisations that have trained therapists as well to deal with the sorts of issues for young people, going back to the last item on domestic abuse. You know, we've had a lot of young women present with uh, experiences during the, the pandemic uh, they're coming to us for food support, but actually, very soon, we, we find that they are uh, in need of support because of what's happening in the home. 
Um, so the work with young people, we're managing to bring the parents into that as well, with specific cases that the, the police are referring to us as well. You know, with, with the young person, mum uh, has soon come into the equation and we've got organisations, one run by herself, a, a bereaved parent. Uh, it's, it's significant, I think, to say that we've had a lot of bereaved friends and relatives in, in those Friday morning meetings, as well as young people. So people who have directly been uh, impacted by violence. And um, she has since set up her own organisation. She's working with parents who really don't know much about uh, uh, the, the county lines or, or, or the gangs in their areas. You know, and, and she's giving back control to those parents so that they've got more of a say over you know, what happens to their, their children. So the, the whole family approach is one that I think that we've got to you know, um, become better at. Over to you. I'd add, I'd add to that, Steve. We work with partner organisations that have been funded by City Hall, like Red Thread, who deal with trauma, um, traumatic experiences, whether it's from a domestic abuse perspective or serious youth violence. Um, we have them regularly at the meetings, so the decision-making regarding grassroots organisations that we fund were well informed by some of the challenges that we face in our local area. In addition to that, we not only support mentoring organisations, but organisations that can also bring a change to the community especially organisations that young people will also buy into, not financially, but they're vested in seeing change. So we've targeted organisations, we work with organisations that they have KPIs of meeting targets of seeing young people get involved in education, employment and training. As you rightly highlighted earlier, that not only are we facing issues regarding the young people as well, it's the family. So once you start a piece of work with a young person, you also find it that mum has more needs than the young person or some of the issues starts with mum and the breakdown with dad and things like that. So we have a tremendous array of services that we are funding, grassroots organisations that are going above and beyond. What I would say is in second point to what you made in relation to the partnership working with the Met, uh, their youth engagement team are present at every meeting on a Friday. We've had live experiences where we've had a young person go missing, we had mum in that needed support. We had a family assessment worker deployed to her that is already being funded. Project Called Walk With Me already being funded. We work with Palace for Life through the Divert program as well. Um, in addition to that, we have a team. We, it's similar in social services, they call it a team around the child. But this, what we do with our minds is pretty much a team around the family, team around the gang, and see how we can work through some of the challenges. We bring them to the party, so to speak, and they engage in all of the services that are on offer. But that's because we've invited them to a place where they can benefit from services. Thank you. I'll leave it to the chair. Thank you, Caroline. Oh, just before we move on, Neil, sorry, do you like to go in? Uh, thanks very much. Uh, and thank, thank you, Chair and Committee, for allowing me to come along today. Um, I, since I don't normally sit on this committee, but I think it's a very important issue. Um, and since I represent Croydon and also Sutton, but specifically for this Croydon, I, I, I asked if I could, could come along. Um, in fact, I've met, and I think this might be the fourth time I've met Anthony in two weeks. Um, one of the things that's really interesting to me is how the theory of like the public health approach to violent crime turns into a reality. I think a, th a theory to me is quite interesting, but it's only really useful if it actually delivers. And so um, uh, I went along to one of those Friday meetings, and it was I, I thought it was a really excellent experience of how the theory turns into practice. And I think, Chair, you were trying to get yourself invited along earlier. I would highly recommend that you, that you do that, come down and uh, see us see down you. in Croydon. Um, I think in particular what I saw was how th there was an issue that came into the meeting. So firstly, you've got, you know, everybody's there. So the police are there, you've got the council, uh, assembly member, uh, the um, guys from Crystal Palace, uh, there's uh, mentoring, plus just, you know, people from the community there. The problem came in and it, it started off with a sort of an emotional response to what was a very serious problem with a particular individual who'd gone missing and who's, who, you know, who was in, not in good circumstances. Um, and it very quickly there went from a sort of compassionate conversation about that individual to a really practical conversation about exactly who was going to do what to try and A, figure out exactly what was going on and B, do something about it. Um, and that I thought was, was, was very positive. Um, the other thing that I would say though is that what makes it work I think are certain key individuals. And I don't know whether Anthony very often gets accused of being overly modest but I think the way he chairs those meetings is really excellent. 
And I think the other thought that I came away from that meeting with was the idea that there probably isn't a factory somewhere that is churning out people like Anthony. And so where we have them, we need to make sure we make use of them. But how you take that idea and make it work in the same way in another area, I think is, that was, that's a difficult question to me. How, it's very easy to sit in a meeting like this and talk about something in one area that's working well, but let's take it to somewhere else and assume it will just take root and work. I think the relationships, the trust, the honesty, you heard Anthony talking earlier, he's a very, very honest guy in the way he talks about things, and I think that's part of what helps to build that trust. So I think there's a question about how you can replicate these things that are working well in one area. And I think the final thought, the Mayans funding which is supporting this, which is partly what we're talking about here today, is a time-limited funding, and all of that work, those relationships, the trust, the meetings, the, the community involvement, um, what I would hate to see is for the funding to run out and for that to dissipate. So the other thought, I think, for all of us to think about is how we make sure that having created all of that human capital in the jargon, all those, that trust and those relationships and those real conversations, how we make sure that that doesn't sort of peter out uh, if the money ends. So th those are my observations. Thank you very much. Uh, as someone who's done youth work for so long, I, I, I recognise what you're saying. And I think one of the challenges for my ends and some of the other work as well, Divert, is to capture what you're doing in order for us to allow us to support you to spread that best practice and, as, and of course continue your own funding. Of course your own funding is your own challenge, but the best practice is something that we'd really like to, 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 to be able to disseminate across London. So to the likes of Steve and Anthony, Roslyn and Marie, that's a challenge that we, we pose to you. And if any way this committee can help, please do let us know, because we'd like to see these things replicated. Anthony. Thank you, Sean, and Neil, thank you very much. Um, Neil's been privileged to show his dance move in front of 50 to nearly 100 people over the weekend, but the respect that was gained just by seeing a politician in the space of young people that are disadvantaged, it carries so much weight, Sean. Um, just in terms of if you actually came to a meeting, the way that you'd raise the aspirations of young black men that would see a black man that's been on TV, a black man that's a politician, and you've got young black men who would have only seen you on TV, but are now in a space where they can have a conversation, it carries value. From your years of youth work experience, you know how young people feel when somebody of notoriety comes to their space. It raises aspirations straight away. But what Neil highlights is very key. What happens after year two of this tremendous work based on human capital? Another statement made by a young person last Friday, how can this be replicated or how can this be taken to other BCUs? What investment will the Met make in seeing a replica of young people and services doing the work that's been done in Croydon, uh, Bromley and Sutton, how will you commit to that financially to seeing change in other boroughs? I, I hate to mention this, uh, Rosalind, you said you're from Hackney. Um, some of the young people that came to the meeting last week, five young men came from Hackney last week and they stated that policing in Hackney is completely different to policing in Croydon. And we believe that that's due to the conversation, the relationships we built in Croydon, but Croydon Met have invested mm. in that. My pushback to the Met are, what commitments are you prepared to make to have some of these young men go to other boroughs and talk about their true experiences to try and build some type of relationship where there's breakdowns in the Hackneys, in the Wilsden areas, in the, in the Halston areas? What can you commit to? Because it's one thing I say to the committee here, that we need to go beyond two, three, four years, but I want to see what the Met are going to do for, for, um, in terms of commitment and resources. That's what I'd, I'd genuinely like to say, to see that continue. C Commander, before you answer, I'll, I'll bring those points back in the wrap up. I, I push my challenge back to Anthony, as somebody who comes from Halston and Wilsden, <laughs> I lived there for a long time, I think we have enough young talent to represent ourselves. That, 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 that would be my pushback there. <laughs> is in my patch and so we'd be really happy to work with you but likewise we've got lots and lots of people that like to see that replicated to deal with some of the challenges down there. Can I, can I move on to Caroline Pidgey please? Pidgey. Um, just um, quickly, um, it's a really interesting conversation and first of all divert, I'm fascinated by the work you're doing I and mean, it's really intensive work but it is that teachable moment isn't it and you're changing people's lives and I think it's, it's really great to hear we're hearing the data but behind it it's about people and their lives. Um, you would mentioned uh, earlier the Engage programme which is going to be doing something similar with under 18s, is that something you're going to be leading on, your organisation, 
and yourself or is it someone completely different? Divert won't be leading on that. So our, our age group is 18 or 25. Plus. Yeah. So who's leading on that? And are you able to feed in some of your learnings into that new programme? I think Nipet would have liked to be here today yeah. to talk from a bias production unit point of view, but Engage is, uh, is like Divert, but for under 18s, and it's currently in Islington at the moment. Um, but there's a desire for it to grow out across all the custody places in the Met as well. Uh, I guess it's slightly different for young people because uh, often, unless it's the most serious offence, they're not charged. Instead, they go, to, as you probably know, to a youth offending team mm -hmm. who makes the best decision around interventions. So, you, <clears throat> so there is some provision there. But having that, t you're right, Caroline, to raise the teachable moment, and I'd love to see that uh, spread out across the whole of them. Okay. Yes. We've got Operation Alliance at Wood Green, which is uh, for, for under 18s. And actually, we find ourselves um, working quite closely together. I mean, just yesterday, there were two uh, codees uh, that, that were there. One was over 18, so I spoke yeah. with him. And then the Operation Alliance youth worker spoke to the younger person. So we are finding that, um, you know, we are, we are doing some crossover work. And I, I would hate to see that, yeah. that go from somewhere like Wood Green, because there are a lot of juveniles that, that tend to come into Wood Green. Yeah. Absolutely. Lots of working. Mm. Um, that's, that's what we're finding within yeah. the map. It'd be nice yeah. if we could get a clear map of all these different funded projects, who's funding them. I mean, I know Red Thread very well. I've done a lot of work with them in the past. Obviously, that's at A&E departments. But to understand this, because it, um, to make sure there's learnings being so, shared. So why, why don't we... I'll, I'll write to... Um, Mopac and asked for a so map of get a clearer understanding that would be helpful. Then I had a couple of questions for um, mm. my ends. Um, what kind of staff do you now see? How do you ensure the work you're delivering is tailored to meet the needs of different communities? And um, possibly maybe for Steve more, but how are you monitoring and measuring impact? What does success look like? And obviously we've got a timeline in terms of your funding, which is frustrating, and I, I, I've seen that over, over so many years, but how do we know what success looks like? To be fair, we haven't started yet. Uh, my ends has only been going since <laughs> April this year, so we're just beginning to fund the organisations that we've been talking about. Um, and we'll have a, a system in place. We're sharing a case management system so that we can track uh, progress individuals and families make on the programme where we talked about that uh, sort of partnership working as well where we've got the groups with young people working alongside the parenting support groups um, the bit about communities I guess I'd say the way the way that we're going to customize my ends is by finding solutions from within our communities I mean as, as our colleague said earlier on we've got to look to ourselves for solutions here and we're doing that every week as I said We've managed to bring in the people who have been impacted by violence to the conversation. They, they are the ones who've led it. And, you know, we're trying to find a new way of working here. We talk about relationship building and trust. I think it really shows itself when uh, not just organisations like ours, but local authorities as well as the police are genuinely going to give that trust to people in communities to, to find their own solutions. So we've talked about refugee uh, communities, asylum seekers. Um, we're investing in a project which is going to be about welcoming people into the borough and move from that into uh, more, more engagement projects, uh, but asking the people who are living in overcrowded housing on, on London Road, a mile away from mansions in Park Hill, uh, to be developing their own kinds of peer support programmes that build into activities, the kind of uh, activities that can qu quite often address mental health issues. Mm -hmm. So, so it, oh, we haven't talked about mental health this morning, um, <laughs> but it's another yes, huge, huge burning yeah. issue through that throughout the pand pandemic. Yeah. And we are looking to our communities to find their own ways of tackling those issues. Of course, we're providing support, working with the police and other authorities to. Um, to, to, to partner them but that's my answer for you I think if we can find through my ends that investment and trust in communities um, to find their own solutions we'll have succeeded sorry just to add as well Steve we've got the currency of over a year of meeting out of 52 weeks we've met 47 out of 52 weeks every Friday mm. a consistent number yes we met through the pandemic socially distanced etc we made it happen uh, that currency of over a year's mm. meetings and relationships of investment from the community 
of being in attendance. Um, there's times where we wanted to stop the meeting, we wanted to have a couple of weeks, we couldn't go away anyway, but we just wanted a couple of weeks break, and they're the ones that were forcing our hands to keep the meetings going. Um, that currency from the community gave us a good framework in terms of what the community needs. Um, I, I hasten to add, um, with the unaccompanied asylum seekers, which has become a major issue on, on our, as the young people call it, on our strip, um, these guys have been very vocal on some of the needs that they have and we've responded to that. Um, we're about to fund organisations, uh, we've just agreed funding for organisations that are doing that direct work. And um, again, our currency is a year's worth of relationships. Mm. Um, the Mayans bid literally jumped in to what we've already started and we were just doing it through our time, Steve, our voluntary time statutory services, but also committing to time as well to be there. So, you know, that currency that we have is a brilliant start. It's a, it's a great platform to launch from. So in some ways, my question is I need to be asking you in a year's time to really see how it's, you know, developing and... and Do you know, we, we can come up with the KPIs. I think we can show you our outputs yeah. and, and, and the numbers and all of that. But again, we are trying to change the way we do business here. And, and how we capture the success stories. And, and it really is going to be partly in terms of how we persuade everyone to come at these issues very differently to, to how they have done in the past. Easier said than done, of course. But you know, the, the reason we've got the results is because we've had the conversation that you're, you know, you're getting today, Sean, but we've linked actions to it within meetings. Mm. And, and we've corralled partners behind actions haven't we yeah. with some people putting their money in their pocket in the, in meetings. the meetings in the meetings but what, what the, really? sorry just Thank intervene you. the, the, the challenge is of course caroline's put is right we at this level in order to advocate for you need those stories need those hard stats because we do have to measure it against another output that could have done something well i've been in community work almost my entire working life and i know sometimes it's hard to capture the quantitative sorry the qualitative progress yes but your challenge your value to your community is to capture that so that we can scrutinize it support it or whatever that's a very very important part of your role i, I would suggest i agree sean but um again you know if if on record i'm sure this recording i'm personally inviting you um i'd hope that you'd come before uh, we take a, a week's break in july but we'd like you to come so you can see it from a qualitative perspective can see the room you can see the young people i'm sure they'd relate to you because of your background um not your hue but your background to be very clear um and i think that would speak volumes in answering uh, the points raised by caroline you we we're in a position now where we can reflect on a year's worth of conversation a year's worth of meetings we can we can reflect because we're here up to a year where some of the uh, eight other seven other Mayans um, community groups, they're starting from fresh, we're a year in. So my real honest answer to you could be, meet with me a year from now. Yeah. And, and add Sean's personal view, coupled with Neil's um, tremendous involvement, mm. and I think you'd have a more rounded answer, to be honest with you. Yeah, lovely, thank you very much, thank you all. I guarantee you I will be coming, I guarantee you that. Did you hear that, Steve? Yeah, I guarantee you that. If I said it, I'd done it, that's my personal rule. <laughs> Um, Caroline Russell, A. Russell, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, and uh, coming in at the end, uh, lots of the questions that I um, uh, um, have uh, have been partially answered, so forgive me if I sort of repeat some stuff that's been partially covered already. Um, but I just wanted to start by echoing just the how inspiring it is to hear about um, the Divert and the Mayans work. It really... Um, uh, it it just sounds it just sounds like it it works and like it's um, uh, just involving community and kind of just yeah it just sounds very effective so um, uh, like others who've expressed their emotion at what they've been hearing I just want to echo that um, now in terms of the proportion of young people who are um, not in school education or training after participating in Divert. We heard um, just earlier, I think, I think it was Anne-Marie said that 1,262 participants, and of those, there are 789 
in training and education. So that's about two thirds are in um, training and education. I just wonder if some of the other third are in employment or whether all of them are, are not in employment or in education or training. Um, so yes, do you have a sense of? Some of those individuals have felt that they no longer want to utilize the service anymore, um, which is up to them because it's, it's a voluntary process and it only works when they work with us. Mm -hmm. um, and we do lots of hand-holding, but eventually they get to the point where they just want to go on their own. So I'd like to think that the majority of those are in employment um, because we haven't necessarily seen them come back into custody. Um, and some of them may have just remained in training or they've just gone off to do their own thing. Yeah, thank you. Um, and. Ros, are you, I mean, you've said quite a lot already about um, the way that custody intervention coaches are, are working, but is there anything that you haven't yet said um, about the, the benefits for, particularly, you know, for young people of working with the custody intervention coaches that you haven't yet said? So in terms of what, what we're drawing on in our, in our state, it's not quick work. You know, yeah. I, I can think of uh, a couple of clients that I met, you know, in 2018, who um, are successful, one of them self-employed, um, but it's about sustaining that as well. Um, what I found during the lockdown is actually I've had some returning clients, um, which then puts you know, added sort of pressure on, on your caseload because you've got, you've got the generation of new clients and then you've got um, existing clients that are going through, you know, particularly bad patches. Um, the apprenticeships were very disrupted during lockdowns. I've, I've got a couple of clients who, you know, they've been sort of derailed from their outcome of getting into an apprenticeship due to the lockdown. Mm -hmm. So what I'm finding is you know, as well as seeing people in custody, it's also trying to uh, encourage people to sustain, you know, a certain mindset in order for them to, you know, um, pursue what, what, what was damaged, I think, during the lockdown. Um, there is a balance that you just need to find as a custody coach between working in custody and working in, in the community. And that sometimes can be quite challenging, especially when there are particular operations that are bringing in a huge amount of people into custody. Um, so I'm not quite sure if that answers your, your question. That that does, um, and I'm thinking. So when you say it's not quick work, um, that means it's not cheap work in that it needs a lot of in, intervention. I mean, I'm just wondering about scaling this up because at the moment it's happening. I think in six custody suites um, out of. 30 um, in right. London, is that right? Yes. And if you were going to be scaling it up, um, is that a, a sort of an incredibly expensive intervention or um, is it something because the benefits in terms of getting people, um, diverting people away from the activities that got them into the custody suite in the first place, um, it, is it... Yes, sort of. How does how does that play out? The sort of the, the intensity of the of the work, and and the cost of it. Okay, so with the um, I think um, correct me if I'm wrong, but what Ros means by it's not quick work is that when we were having this conversation earlier this morning, that you do tend to have returning clients because that relationship is almost cemented from the from the get go because mm. you are at times their family support and you are their, their central um, network, if you like. So if they need anything, access to food, support with completing a benefit application, help to fight to source clothes for an interview, they always gravitate back to you. Yeah. So I believe that that's what Ros means. I mean, back in 2015, I was the practitioner in Brixton Custody Suite. And that's where this all started. So I, I understand that. And back in 2015, there was one particular client 
that I was working with, who is still on our books today, um, because he's just, he's almost at a loss if he doesn't have someone like, like the Divert Programme to, mm -hmm. to hold his hand, because it's almost like, yes, he has a family network, but he feels that we are his family. Mm -hmm. And he's, I'm not necessarily saying he's hard to shake off, but <laughs> it's just, it's that relationship, isn't it? Yeah. To him, I'm yeah. probably that, that mother figure or that, that auntie figure that he doesn't have. Um, and I'm, we're there to guide him and support him as best as we can. With regards to the scale of it, we are going to be expanding our footprints. We're going to be in 12 custody suites in total. Um, but with that relationship with the football clubs, that complements our work. It supports everything that we do. So I'd say it's going to be relatively easy, wouldn't it, to, to scale up the program um, and not really have that much of an impact on how we work and still be able to output that, I suppose, exceptional quality that we're doing at the moment. <laughs> Sorry, Karen, just to interrupt. Surely the value calculation is the value of your co your 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 client profile because obviously some people are much harder to work with than others. Some some just need an indication. Others need years of support. I suppose the the value calculation becomes what's the profile of your clients and what would they be doing without your services? Because Caroline is correct; it could cost, but it's cost relative to the other social interactions or or financial interaction that City Hall... Chair, I was implying yeah. it was good value. Yeah, no, no, I, I, and I'm just suggesting, I'm making the suggestion the way to calculate that value is to look at what that client would be doing without your service versus what they what your service provides for them. I wasn't suggesting anything at all, actually. Okay. Where you go? Sh shall I continue? <laughs> shall I continue? Oh, yeah, sorry, Carla, I said please continue. Thank you. Um, Commander, um, what do you think have been the key challenges in achieving these positive outcomes for the young people that have been participating in the DIVERT programme? Um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, I, I totally agree with what's been said. Things don't change overnight. You, you don't signpost somebody to a, a referral mechanism and they take it up and you know, everything's all right after that. Um, it is a bit like in Croydon, relationships built over long periods of time. And we often find in offender management, you refer to the integrated offender management team, so sometimes before you even diagnose what the issue is, let alone look at the treatment, you need to get somebody in a place where they're motivated to change. Um, so it's that sort of three, three pronged approach. Um, and so um, these, these are things that the police are not good at excelling at, but experienced practitioners like we have here are really good at working at. Uh, and you know, this is the public health approach where we understand what we can bring. There's a teachable moment where someone's under huge pressure in a custody block. They meet someone who is friendly, who cares about their long-term impact, and who commits to a relationship. You know, you spoke about 2015 over years. Uh, I, I think that's, that's the key challenge, is not to expect things to happen overnight. Um, but I'm so, I'm so glad it exists. And the other unquantifiable benefit is the impact that it has on police officers, you know, where we don't see people as good people or bad people, but you see, you know, the, the spectrum. Um, those people in the custody block think, oh, the police aren't just here about, um, you know, incarcerating me and getting me in prison. They also want me to change. So, you know, we change as a result of divert as well. Our perceptions change, the young people or the adults' perceptions change. So I, I, think, it's, I think it's all good. Thanks. And th are there any specific actions that are being taken to increase the proportion of the young people who do get involved in education, training or employment? Or are you, is it, do you think, inevitable that there's going to be a, a cohort that, that don't? I mean, I, I would say that with the, when I spoke about the figures earlier and what, what our expectation is to see five people per week across the 12 sites once we are fully up and running, I'd say that 40% of those individuals will end up going into training, education or employment. 
And, you know, let's face it, we're working off of three things here. Is that individual ready? Are they willing? And are they reliable? Mm -hmm. And if they're not any of those three things, it's quite difficult to affect change anyway. Yeah. And that's what we make very clear at the beginning of the relationship. Are you these three things? If you are, we can work. If you're not, we'll still be here. But in order for us to really make a difference to you and your future, you have to be ready, willing and reliable. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Back to you, Chair. Thank, thank you. I, I really recognise that last step you made. I used to run a job club and it was incredible how important the attitude of the, the client you were dealing with. You know, if, if they were ready, you could try to make things happen. And it, it's, it's a mark of your quality that your whole programme operates off those three principles. I think it makes it much easier for us to understand what you do. I'd just quickly like to bring in um, the Hall. people, I hate it I mentioned this, but um, are you, if you're expanding, are you then going to set into place some way of actually measuring reoffending levels? Because clearly as we go on, uh, it's taxpayers' money going into things. We have to, n not only the good stories, which are so important, you have to prove that it really does work. So are you going to up the ante on um, monitoring reoffending levels? Because you've been going six years now. Is there any evidence of reoffending? Absolutely. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, that was all being evaluated, or is all being evaluated by the College of Policing, and we're waiting for their final report. And when, when that, is that likely to come out? We're hoping it's going to be soon. Okay, well, we perhaps we'll definitely be, be sent that. Soon. Thank you very much. But if we, I mean, I, I hate to quote old figures, um, because they probably won't mean much now, but very early on, um, when I was in the Met and when this program first started, because I've been working on Divert since its inception back in 2015, and I've been lucky enough to stick very closely to it and watch it grow and develop and expand and become the program that it is today, and I'm really proud of that. But back in those days, we saw 116 individuals, and of that 116 individuals, we managed to bring the reoffending rate down to, I think it was 8%. But you see, that's so, brilliant, because then you can prove that the money going in is saving us money big. anyway. Exactly. So, thank so you very much. In the, then it was all about proving, does this work? Because, you know, I was toddling off into custody, and I had to deal with so many different issues with regards to the policing culture and just the cynical views of individuals. Um, but I wanted to affect change, and I demonstrated that through my work, and as a result, we had this really good reoffending rate. And off the back of that, we've been able to grow and develop and become what we are today. Excellent. Well, I look forward to that. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Assembly Member Hall. It comes to me to ask the last question. I think your last statement will demonstrate the, the, some of the journey the police service has been on, the move from a force to a service, and, 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 and washing that, that that, that thought process out of the system and replacing it with something you are, I think is important. But it, it, it brings me to the final and in a way most obvious question, and, and I put it to everybody. What more should the mayor do or could the mayor do to help reduce violence in London? If, if I start with Anthony and, and go around. Continue to support and invest in grassroots organisations that are doing the work, um, reaching those that others may find it a challenge to reach invest in the grassroots organisations that are taking the time, the effort, the energy, the community organisations, whether it's faith-based groups, whether it's uh, uh, voluntary sector organisations, which would be my preference in investment, but continue to make a commitment over the next few years, not only two years, but let's see, uh, let's be able to measure it based on five, ten years uh, and, and look at what the future holds. But yes, it will be to invest in smaller organisations, grassroots organisations that are doing the real work. Thank you, Steve. And enable us to carry that conversation on with other funders. Because you're absolutely right, we have to show results if we're going to get sustainability. But when it's short term, that's the frustration. So funders do a fair amount to join up their programmes, but maybe not enough. You know, we need to be able to look at 10-year investments. 
uh, and, and the sort of work we're doing, you were touching on employment support. Uh, 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 sorry, my eyesight's so bad I can't see the name of your colleague. But um, uh, you know that, that issue around employment support, the, the music uh, groups that we're working with, um, that are very much about young people and that peer-to-peer -peer support. Uh, they, they've, they've just introduced a course we're funding called Getting Into the Music Business. So they're going to be supporting young people to get certificates, to produce their own music videos, record their own songs, and to go into a 12-week week program, which hopefully will you know, lead them into uh, a, a whole career. Um, so we can capture these stories, but we need a way of sustaining it and scaling it up, because there are nine people who are going to go on this, nine young people. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you know, we would obviously want to offer it to 90 young people. Thank you. Come on. Thanks. If I may say two things. The, I think it's been really good today to see that to tackle violence, you, you need a systemic, uh, you know, the cliché public health approach. And in some areas, you have sort of joint area inspections where Ofsted look at children's services and the Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary look at police and they look at it together. And I think we've got an example here of partnerships working really well. But, you know, there's different levels of partnerships partnership effectiveness across London um, and perhaps the Mayor can use uh, his power of convening to look at how do we uplift um, our partnership effort and that doesn't mean just statutory partners it does mean with uh, NGOs voluntary agencies and community groups as well to make them all different but firing on all cylinders that would be the big thing for me and my second point which isn't an answer to your question but I just thought it's been slightly under underplayed today is some of the systemic work that some of the specialist departments have done around drivers of crime in London, um, money and guns in particular. So some of the specialist investigation teams, you know, this last 12 months, £47 million in cash in £20 notes has been seized. Triple that amount if you talk about accounts frozen. And these are money launderers, high level drug dealers, um, over 450 guns that can fire a lethal bullet, not air weapons, you know, proper guns and machine guns have been seized so um, there are these systemic sort of organized crime focus that the Met is also giving that we haven't just had broadcast much today chair which I just wanted to drop in as well thank They're you my two points thanks appreciate that thank you um, I definitely say investing in um, grassroots organizations uh, investing in programs like Divert and Mayans to maintain that sustainability because Yes, the funding we are so appreciative of, but then I, I do wonder to myself what's going to happen in the next couple of years. You know, we've given so many people this lifeline of support, and to have that pulled from under their feet, it's, it's going to be so damaging to the community and to our young people. They are our future, and we need to invest in them as much as possible, and we can only do that through long-term funding. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I think, I, I, I think that Anna is right in the sense that the future, if we're looking at the future, we've got to look at who we're educating for the future. And for me, I, I do feel like there needs to be much more into the curriculum, into school curriculums, because I think that this, this, this violence is becoming, you know, it's affecting younger and younger generation. And and having been in offender learning um, and then trying a bit of a sort of school, uh, working in schools after I left uh, offender learning, it struck me that actually the curriculum is a place where this education can be delivered. But heads are obviously under a lot of pressure to deal with certain priorities in terms of you know, creating a, a prepared workforce. But there needs to be a lot more personal development and a lot more education that comes in about these risks because it is affecting children. Okay. So that, that's, that's one of my main points. A lot more investment in terms of the education so that it, we can have that long-term effect. Um, f thank you all for your points. I think here I'll summarise. Sorry, could I ask a last, last question, which is directly on the back of what you've just asked as well? Please Thank do. you. Um, so I think everybody in this room would believe very fundamentally in prevention rather than cure. If we can prevent a young person um, going to, you know, get, getting to the custody suite, then that's what we'd like to do in, with the, the initiatives that you've all described. Um, 
I, you know, and this is very Croydon orientated actually, but this session I think, because I have a big history in Croydon. I used to work for CVA actually, Steve, as well, with families and young children. And I, the work that I've done and the work that I've seen done through uh, initiatives such as Sure Start, which works holistically with both families and children at the early years stage of development, used to have an effect, I think, on stopping escalation of issues. And I'd like to know what the panel thinks about early years intervention. So we're not talking about the acute stage, where we're, you know, 13, 14 and beyond, talking about the much younger stage and actually making those interventions there. And I really would like to hear what you all have to say. So, Rosalind, as a, you know, as you, the example of being in a custody suite, how many times have you sat there and thought, if 10 years ago we could have done something different with this? Yeah, often. I mean, I, I, I said the example of um, I'd worked in a couple of schools as a TA, um, and in the custody suite, I can remember seeing at least three to four children from those schools in, in the custody. <laughs> and, and I thought, this, th there has to be some kind of link here. Um, you, you talk about Sure Star, I mean, all these initiatives that had so much funding in the beginning and wasn't just about, you know, uh, providing quality childcare. It was about looking at those social economic issues um, to, 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 you know, looking at the families and looking at the unemployment and all the rest of it. It is, it is, it is it's much wider than obviously just educating the children. But yeah, I, 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 I believe that there needs to be something definitely in curriculums and in uh, initiatives for early years that addresses some kind of, you know, uh, prevention of risk of, of, of getting into particular areas. That, to me, is a, is a public health concern. I'd, I'd echo that. I mean, for me, I think it's so, so important that these conversations and early intervention within primary schools is there. I mean, I've, I'm a mum. I've got two young children. And I, I sit there and I listen to some of the conversations and I watch some of the kids in the school and it's almost like I can see where some of them are heading and it's so worrying and it's so scary. And I just wish that there were more provisions to invest in some of these schools. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I've written up a, a domestic violence e-learning course because I feel that it's needed and that's just through things that I've identified through uh, working on the Divert programme, through my own experiences, through looking at my young kids, going to school and listening to some of the conversations. And I feel that as a mother who is very much involved in my local community, I need to take actions. So I think it's, it's valuable. We definitely need to, to look at early years intervention. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, well, I, I couldn't agree more in two respects. Uh, you know, there's a guy called Thomas Apt who's done a lot of work on violence in the States and, and he looks at what's effective for different agencies and you know his work, clarion call for policing is look first stop the bleeding and uh, there is a role here for the police to work on stopping the, the bleeding um, long term how you stop that is through early intervention that doesn't is not work the police excels you know well at the early intervention foundation gives loads of these evidence-based practices and our officers like you will see uh, particularly the more experienced ones are, oh, yeah, I used to deal with your dad, uh, you know, and it's again and again. So I, I do think it's probably less a role for the police, but the investment in early intervention uh, is, is necessary to cut that chain of generation to generation, I think. To keep the Croydon theme going, we've got George Hosking in Croydon, the Wave Trust, that has done a lot of great work around early intervention, you know, going back to the nought to four years. and. Um, We've had a lot of focus on adverse childhood experiences through our uh, work around vulnerable adolescents, looking at all those traumas, trying to you know, uh, deal with those issues from such an early age. And um, all, all I'd say at the risk of um, sounding again, motherhood and apple pie, it, it's a strengths-based approach we have to take here. If, we, if we're going to support people to overcome these issues, I think we've got to work to uh, the, the, the fantastic things that parents can bring. You know, we've got to empower them as parents to, to deal with issues. And uh, that's, I think, the, the way that we need to build on prevention uh, and relationship building 
by giving people the opportunities to make, you know, to work on their passions, build the best uh, that they can for their families. I, I genuinely echo uh, the panel's views. One challenge I have uh, in response to your question and to the chair is that in Croydon currently, as we're under section 114, we've had some terrible news that children's centres are going to be reducing. Um, so I can't not answer without giving you the, dealing with the elephant in the room. Sadly, um, I sat in a meeting last night and many parents are unaware that they're losing a children's centre. Um, some parents will now have to travel three miles um, to get early years intervention from a local uh, children's centre. I have grave concerns about that because you are right, and it's been mentioned here, that we need to meet the needs um, at the earliest point. Um, some two-year-olds, three-year-olds are exposed to things that are absolutely devastating, and the fact that they don't have a local children's centre where they could go to or where a mum could reach out for help or a father could reach out for help. I have major concerns about that. Um, I'm arguing it currently at a local level. Um, we've got a consultation that finishes on Sunday where there's going to be rubber stamped on decisions made regarding children's centres in Croydon. So that for me is a major thing. It's a major challenge. Um, we need our children's centres. We need to have agencies and services in these children's centres that could uh, supply information, advice and guidance that could help with children and their futures. Um, but right now, for me, a major challenge is that Croydon are about to lose some children's centres. I'm not happy about it. Um, I'll say it on this level, I'll say it publicly on any level. It's, it's a major concern that well, our children are now being affected by this. Thank you all for your comments. I'll just, just to summarise, come to Ezra the meeting. I'm hearing that we want long-term maintenance funding People need to understand where the funding's coming from so I can plan for the future. As someone who's run several community um, charities, I understand that. But the challenge is, of course, finding that funding. We've all had to come through the pandemic as a nation, and that's had an effect on us. And it's about scale. We've talked this morning at length about some very good practice that we'd all like to see spread across London. But the point was very um, eloquently made that it's not just about the money, it's about the expertise, it's about the commitment. It's about the experience to make these things happen. So we couldn't just give the money. We'd have to find a way of finding the right people to make these things happen as well. And the, the thing that really I'll take away from this is, is, is a, a, re, a, re, a reaffirmation of my belief that it's about family and community. Ultimately, if we can strengthen families, why that's important is because it gives the same help across time in a way that that negates funding, it gets round funding, you, you lock that expertise in a community. And it's very, very inspiring to have a conversation about defeating crime in London and it to involve parents. Because much of these conversations don't talk about parents. The strength of this morning's conversation has been, we started in enforcement and we've ended in community and community will aid enforcement, it'll eradicate the need for enforcement. Hopefully that's what we're aiming for. But with that in mind, I'd just like to thank all of our guests for coming. You have been an absolute education this morning. Um, I want to guarantee you, I will be attending a meet meeting very shortly. I'm just gonna look at my procedure note to see where I'm at. There we go. Can I ask the committee to note the report and the discussion we've had this morning? Can I ask the committee to can I also ask delegate authority to meet the chair in consultation with, dep with deputy chairman and party group leads to agree any outputs arising from this meeting? Please. Can I ask the committee to note the work programme, current meeting date and agreed and as agreed at the annual general meeting on 14th of May 2021? Can I also delegate authority? And in business that arose in our pre-meeting can you just take that on board when we come to look at the work program because i think following on from this conversation we need the violent um reduction unit lib peck and co to come before us and probably need a very long session rather than a short session uh, when she comes back so if you could take that on board i'd be grateful so what i've done thank you for your comments assembly member duval what i've done is i've arranged to have one single session just with with the violence reduction unit okay. because it will take i think it, it deserves that level of scrutiny so that will be the replacement for what happened this as meant to happen this morning the work program is not solidified i'm about to see group leads so that I can have their input to solidify the work program so be assured that that's still in trade and there's lots of room for maneuver there because i haven't 
solidify that because I haven't spoken to a group lead yet. So that all will happen. So thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Where was I? Uh, can we also mm -hmm. delegate authority to me as a chair in consultation with deputy group leads and needs to agree the annual report summarising the work of the committee over the past year? The next, meet, the next meeting of the committee is scheduled for Wednesday, the 23rd of June, 2021, at 10 p.m. in this chamber in City Hall. 10 a.m. until 10 p.m. Okay. I, I have no urgent business, which, which concludes today's meeting. Any more? Any more? Thank you.